My fellow Westorians, I'm Aziz, with me is Ashea, and this is Valar Reredis. Each episode of Valar Reredis for the Winds of Winter will feature a guest or guests. We'll take a closer look at each chapter, going through them one by one instead of in batches. A standard warning must apply as well. These chapters are subject to change by the time we see them, although... As we'll see with one of today's chapters, it's been released quite clearly. The other one, though, hmm, not so much. Today's guest is a good friend of ours, someone we've known for a while, hung out with in person at conventions, had good times and good conversations. Gray Area, welcome to History of Westeros. She might be muted. Hello, hello, hello. You might still be muted. We can't hear you. What about now? Now, yeah, we can. There we oh, go. sorry, sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, hey, everyone, glad to be here. Um, talk talk about Tyrion with Ash and Aziz, uh, and talk about winds, just everything that's going on. Yeah. Grateful to be here. Cool, right on. Well, what have you been doing over on your channel? I know that you have lots of excellent Game of Thrones, A Song of Ice and Fire coverage, but you do occasionally do some other stuff too and that's one of the fun things about your channel is you never quite know what's going to be popping up <laughs> <laughs> so um i've been doing obsidian nights podcast every wednesday dire wolf city with alicia and mandy and ara where we're going through like winds of winter characters and what they might be doing in winds um i also like to do like a lot of witcher stuff and yeah. american horror story and all that stuff Cool. That's awesome. Yeah, it's good. It's you get your. That's one of the fun things about just having your own channel. You can just do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> and people like, like vibe with that. Yeah, that's cool. So yeah, I've been a fan for a while too, and I know a lot of people here today are already, and a few others will be uh, having their first experience. So that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> So each episode of Val Arboretus for the Winds of Winter will also start with a history of the chapter itself. As usual, it's pretty brief. Just a few details about what came along. I actually made a small mistake last week saying Victorian's chapter was third. It was second. Tyrion 1 was actually third uh, of the sample chapters, meaning to make its way to the public. Of course, we don't know, actually know what order George wrote them in. We just know what order they, you know, escaped his basement and made it out into the world. So Theon 1 was the first. And this one, Tyrion 1, was read at MissCon in Missoula, Montana, which again was where the Victorian chapter was read for the second time. So I will repeat that Missoula, Montana in May 2012 was the place to be two Winds of Winter chapters read and neither have been ever read again as far as we know. So what on earth? <laughs> That's, talk about missing out and, and not knowing that that was the one chance. But the Victorian chapter recording is incomplete, as most of you uh, know already, since you heard the episode or knew that ahead of time. And for Tyrion 1, we have even less. It's only a few snippets uh, from that reading, which is why we're doing these two chapters together. We're, we're you know, mixing them together. They, have a, they, they follow each other chronologically, and we have a lot more on the second one than on the first one. So yeah, as, as far as the second one goes... The full and official release was March 21st, 2014. It was actually released on the World of Ice and Fire app. It can still be found there. That app is pretty cool. It's got a lot of handy things you can look up. And it's got four of the sample chapters, which is nice. And it's the seventh of the 11 chapters that have been released. And what, interestingly, though, there's a bit of a confusion in the fandom. And uh, you may be, you a lot of you all may share this confusion the ch in the app, in that World of Ice and Fire app, the chapter is called Tyrion 1, even though it's Tyrion 2. B but there's a chance that George has changed his mind. Maybe he scrapped Tyrion 2 or Tyrion 1. But as you'll see, there's some things that are missing that he just can't skip over. So either way, it's something to think about. It's not super important for us to worry about. Just a piece of trivia. The chapters will work themselves out. We'll play with what we've got now. And there is a lot to work with. This chapter has a ton going on. We have three POVs for the Battle of Slaver's Bay, also known as the Battle of Fire. And of those three, it's clearly Tyrion we're the most familiar with. I mean, that's not close. Victorian and Barristan combined don't have as many chapters as Tyrion. And, of course, he reflects himself that this is not his first battle. It's his third. 
and you know, vice versa, Victorian and Barristan have more battles than Tyrion has chapters. <laughs> but we haven't seen any of their battles, and we've seen all of Tyrion's. So starting off, Gray, what's your first just impression of what we have so far from the Winds of Winter? You know, we've got these Battle of Fire chapters, and we've got you know, there's a couple of things scattered around elsewhere. Is it just making you more and more hype, or what are your thoughts <laughs> in general? <laughs> um, it is making me hype. Like my first reaction to uh, Tyrion. To I, I I feel like the first I feel like the Tyrion one the windblown one I think that might be scrapped. Hmm. Like yeah. I think I think Tyrion the the battle might be the first Tyrion one okay. of a, the Winds of Winter. But my first reaction was like, oh, it's, it's getting nasty in Marine. Um, <laughs> it was very reminiscent of the Blackwater. Yeah. Um, but I one of the funny things is I found that Tyrion was really looking up to. Tywin kind of like he was laying it on when it comes to Tywin almost like with admiration and not exactly hate which is kind of different for me with Tyrion that's also, a great point yeah yeah the in the war like was really nasty around them like the bodies being flung around that was that was gross um <laughs> screaming the people dying like it's it's a horrifying chapter but one of the things that stood out to me the most was the white dragon Sivas piece oh, yeah. um being bloody and i think that might be some foreshadowing that something might happen to viserion in marine Ooh. That's a great idea because I had, I think a lot of people interpret that scene as maybe suggesting who might ride Viserion and not to be, not that it can't be both, but I like that idea a lot. So we'll, that's a major thing that we'll discuss this episode for sure, um, along with all these other things you mentioned. But yeah, I, I, one, one comment you just made, I want to address right away about Tyrion and the way he, he's thinking about his father. Of course, that's a huge topic. Whenever we talk about Tyrion and his father it always comes up, but you're right. He's not thinking of him in the same ways. He's not thinking of him like as their personal relationship. He's thinking of him as a general, right? That's yeah. like, he's not as a father. And that's, that's a bit of a change. Um, okay. So our, our, Goofy uh, homemade titles for this one. Tyrion one is adrift on the windblown, aka love at first sight of flight. Probably <laughs> <laughs> we have to go probably there because we don't actually know what happens in that chapter. Tyrion two, a sword is mightier than the pen, aka reign of fire corpses. Uh, adrift on the windblown because well, Tyrion suggests the plan that the windblown are already doing, <laughs> so they're kind of following in their footsteps without knowing it. Probably won't actually get the chance. And one thing that I'm looking forward to seeing that we either skipped over because we missed it in Tyrion 1, it's part of the section that's missing, or just stuff that, you know, maybe it's going to have to be rearranged, or we may have to rewrite some stuff, is his first reaction to seeing dragons. And that's why I mean by love at first sight. Tyrion is in his first chapter, he's talking about, he's thinking about talking and thinking about dragons right away. So we know that's probably foreshadowing that's going to be in part of his arc, but that doesn't actually happen until like now, five books later. So I actually have this question later in the document, but let's just go to it now. What do you think about that? Like, do you have thoughts on how you think Tyrion would react? Is that something that's like really been building um, up? Are you looking forward to that? I am looking forward to that because a lot of like in a Game of Thrones, he's so like, when he talks about his childhood, like he was so in love with the dragons and, and dragons and dragon lore, like he's stolen books or not stolen. He borrowed books from the Winterfell <laughs> Library. He probably would have like, stolen. Don't, you know. don't, don't <laughs> la let's not label him a thief. <laughs> but he borrowed books from the Winterfell Library about dragons. And um, he like the first time he visited King's Landing, he went down to see the dragon skulls. Like he has an obsession with dragons. So and he even has dreams like he had that dream in dance where like he's fighting on a battlefield and dragons are like flying around and he's like uh what's his name with the baby head coming out the oh, shoulder? Oh, the monstrous, yeah. Yeah, like he he's kind of like Melee's where he has two heads. Yeah, that is such a strange dream. Yeah, and Makoro of course gets makes that quote says, you know, you're in the middle of it all, dragons uh, young and old, bright and dark. And this this chapter really makes me feel that way because it really is he really is in between all this stuff like you got Victorian on one side, Barris on the other side. And the dragons are yeah. literally above them. <laughs> I, and one, one thing I really liked that the show did was when he saw Drogon in yeah. Valyria, like the reaction of just, he was just in awe of the dragons. But I feel like 
Tyrion seeing these dragons may be a big changing point for him. Ooh. Like we haven't seen it in Tyrion too in this chapter, but I feel like it's gonna give him like something to live for. Like mm. not just the dragons, but the dragon queen is gonna like there may be something still left here for me. That's a great I idea. Like. Yeah, like he's because he's always loved dragons, and and we're not sure he's sold on Danny even. That's something. Yeah. That some some during our discussions of of this chapter, we it comes to realize that yeah, we 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 discuss agency a lot, right? And with Tyrion, mm -hmm. this is something that's a big deal because he's lost a lot of his agency, and it's easy to think that he's just going to get it all back. And it's easy to think that to fall in the trap of thinking he's joining Danny because he wants to, but really, like, what other choice does he have? <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, not many. So, um, so you're right that stay going to Danny as a queen might be about survival, but going to Danny as the dra mother of dragons might be about that is something he's like legit interested in on a personal level. And even though he doesn't like know her yet, like he's seen, like she basically saved his life Yeah, in the fighting pits. So. And he did that, that a pretty good job when he, said i don't know her but i i can he, he kind of grokked part of her personality by telling you know saying she's a rescuer she's done this she's tough she's because just by sussing out all the things she's done he can yeah. get a read on <laughs> some of her personality. I was like well she's clearly not weak i mean come on <laughs> you can yeah. you can judge a few things from that so yeah he's really good at that um mm -hmm. so and as far as the second part of the title there we have the sword is mightier than the pen which, of course, this is this has been an ongoing theme of the recent Tyrion chapters. He signed all these contracts, right? First, he signs the contract to join the Second Sons. He signs contracts to pay them these absurd sums of money if things go well, right? Ten thousand k or ten thousand gold to one guy, uh, you know, all this money to another guy. There's just a hundred papers or so that he signs. So there's a lot of debt he incurred, but also that kind of helps keep him alive because they want to try to collect on that. And well, uh, Jorah shows when the sword is mightier than the pen by stabbing the messenger, kind of forcing the issue. The issue was probably going to be forced anyway, but Jorah's taking no chances. And then Reign of Fire corpses, well, that's just me being punny. You know, the movie Reign of Fire is a thing, and it's a post-apocalyptic dragon film. Personally, I call it the number one post-apocalyptic dragon film of all time, because it's the only post-apocalyptic dragon film of all time, <laughs> but it's a, I think it's a pretty fun movie. And this, uh, in, in it, there's a lot of, you know, corpse eating and dragons flying around. So, hey, why not? Let's make that connection. The other stuff about Tyrion 1, uh, there's more Sivas in it, which is maybe one of the reasons that uh, some people suspect, maybe that's part of your suspicion that it's it's been cut, because there's a lot of stuff that maybe we don't need. I think the reaction is maybe the only thing we really need. And that's uh, possibly why the chapter will be rewritten or have that added on. Um, just to refer back to, I agree with you about the, the the show's version. It was so, that was really good. Like that's one of the, it was like a real high point of, of that uh, portion of the, of the arc. Yeah, he um, was speechless. <laughs> yeah, that's like you let the actor do their, like that's the kind of thing that an actor, especially a really good actor like Peter Dinklage is, is perfect for. Cause it's, it is like George is going to do a good job writing it, but that's the kind of thing that seeing it is maybe has even potential to have even more impact. Um, so everybody's worried about the Volantine ships showing up, but and that is one of the things that happens near the end of Tyrion 1. And Jorah spies the Kraken banners. Uh, more on that later, because, of course, something that's really interesting kind of under the radar theme here is that both Jorah and Tyrion are Westerners, right? Like Jorah is a Northwesterner, <laughs> but he's not part of the West, but he's from Bear Island. And the thing that Bear Island and Lannisport have in common is a lot of Ironborn raids and, and attacks over the years. And so they have that kind of cultural thing shared. So in Tyrion 2, let's do a quick synopsis. The Second Sons are about to be caught between the surprise attacking Ironborn and the surprise attacking armies of the Queen, led by... Uh, Barris and Selmy. With battle imminent, Tyrion turns to his best weapon, his brain, quite sure that his uh, side needs to be switching sides as soon as possible. The first order of business is getting on his armor and managing his fear. He manages that okay, but trauma of his own guilt puts him into a violent rage that he almost does not manage. The sounds of battle is what snaps him out of it. 
Viserion and Rhaegal, themselves second sons of a sort, have emerged from Marine, the latter circling the bay as ships clash and burn, while closer by the white dragon is taken to burning plague corpses in midair as they're hurled from six so-called wicked sister uh, w- w- wicked sisters, the trebuchets that continue to bombard Marine with plague. Some of the flaming bodies land on people and horses, and that doesn't exactly help the sense of panic and chaos everywhere around them. Finding yourself surrounded on all sides by plague and war is terrible enough. But now they have dragons coming at them from above. I mean, it's one you have things from all directions, and now they have above as well. Goodness. This is intense for participants and for readers, and it's really just getting started. The dragons are also a good reminder of why Tyrion is quite certain they're on the wrong side. And the arrival of the Ironborn bearing dragon standards is a huge piece of additional supporting evidence. Yeah, don't fight against that. Differing messengers, one with a sexified breastplate, demand that the second sons join the fight. The orders don't make a whole lot of sense, and that adds to the general confusion just everywhere. And the Yunkish, with their weird, ill-advised rotating command structure, only makes that worse and worse. Uh, The news of who killed a certain commander is really important. It was the Windblown who did it, and that's our clue to realize Barristan's plan to send Garrus and Archibald with an offer to the Tattered Prince to switch sides in exchange for Pentos has clearly worked. In other words, there's another reason to switch sides, even though Tyrion doesn't actually know. So uh, the messenger is annoyed by Tyrion calling out arguments against him. And well, this messenger does a pretty terrible job reading the room. Well, tent. When you find yourself alone in a tent or any place with a bunch of professional killers who are currently and obviously plotting to turn on you, it's a terrible idea to give them more incentive to turn on you. He showcases that ignorance when he notices Tyrion, yelling that he's an escaped slave, demanding to be returned. The second sons, of course, don't want to give him up because of all that gold we just talked about. But the messenger still doesn't seem to get it. He he must think that don't shoot the messenger is something that people really, really uh, adhere to. But no, they definitely don't. And Jorah says, okay, you're talking about sending Tyrion back to a slave owner that also owned me and I'm not down with that. I didn't sign over any of my wealth for my people. Well, he probably doesn't have any to sign over. Bear Island, not exactly rich, but that's beside the points. Yes, points, plural, the point of the pen and the point of the sword. As Illyrio told Tyrion and Inkpots recently reiterated, some contracts are written in ink, some in blood. So yeah, his death proves you can't always rely on a contract signed at sword point, but this man's death is a contract in blood, a turning point. There's no going back now. So surprise, the second sons for the second time take the side of Daenerys over the Yunkish. Pretty smart. <laughs> so what do you think about all that? You have a general reaction to the synopsis and, and follow-up question. What do you think of this narrative structure? I asked Joe Magician this, the same question last week. Battles at the start, like a bunch of battles, not just this one. We're going to have the Battle of Ice. We're going to have Battle of Blood with Euron. Like, that's a really different approach, right? Usually they're kind of a thing you get at the end of a book. So big, different feel, huh? Are you muted? My first reaction to the synopsis is the Wicked Sisters are terrible. Like, that's (laughs) awful. Like, just that is the most disgusting thing that I've ever seen, it's horrifying. (laughs) Um, But the structure though, like I personally like it. I feel like George said himself like that he left us with a lot of cliffhangers and dance. So I like the idea of opening up this book with two major battles, the Battle of Ice in Winterfell and the Battle of Fire in Marine. And then him saying that like, they're gonna be wrapped up fairly shortly in the books makes me think like this may signal like that the rest of the book is going to be lots and lots of politics and pulling plots together and towards Westeros, especially like with the people in Essos. So like Tyrion, Daenerys, Arya. Um, But even still, like, I don't think like that's going to be all the battles and wins because I think George like has said something about like doing a Sam POV and Sam is an old town. And I think like this POV is, POV is supposed to be before or after battle. And I know there are tons of theories about like this battle going down in Old Town with Euron. And there's also probably going to be a battle with John Cunnington. So I, I and, and Aegon and Storm's End. So like this, this book is going to be a lot of action, but also a lot of answers. Because I feel yeah. like there's going to be a lot of dialogue scenes like after battles aftermath yeah a lot of that yeah like aftermath stuff yeah 
Well said. Yeah, that's uh, and then heck, we didn't even mention like the wall, like John's situation with, yeah. the, with the free folk, and then hard home, and then like there's got to be battles with the others and undead. Like that's more vaguely foreshadowed. It isn't like we know there's a battle like right about to happen with these other ones. So yeah, you're yes. right. There's going to be a lot of battles. So there's a lot of action for sure. And then with all that, they'll have to be aftermath because I think George. I think I'm not sure what he prefers to write, but I think he finds aftermath more meaningful. Um, but he's really good at adding you know, stuff during battles that isn't pure action. So I'm looking forward to that as well. And just the action. I mean, heck, I'm not down on the action. <laughs> of course not. I love the action too. Especially the first time when you don't know what's going to happen, you know? Yeah. That's really good. I uh, could do without the Wicked Sisters though. <laughs> like, I could just do without them. <laughs> that maybe, we're, maybe it's good that that didn't make TV, just flying plague <laughs> corpses. Yeah, like maybe we didn't need to see that. <laughs> yeah. And the dragons are really unpredictable, too. I think that's one thing the show didn't do a lot of, like, I don't remember. The show didn't even, did the show even do Hosea? I don't remember the show doing Hosea even, or did it? Anyway. I think they did. Okay, they did do Hosea. I was trying to, I was like, as, as it came out of my mouth, I'm like, wait, maybe they did. But they didn't do a whole lot more with that. Um, it, by itself, that's a lot, though, just showing yep. the unpredictability of the dragons. And we really see that here. I mean, Rhaegal is just out there in the bay apparently torching a ship or two but it's not clear whether he did that or whether the ironborn did that and i'm not clear on that because victorian says capture the ships you know capture as many ships as possible because we need them but he also mm -hmm. sends a fire ship up river to block the skahazadon so clearly there's a little a little both going on so i don't know do you do you think Rhaegal's burning ships or i don't know if it's just hard to tell or is that just kind of <sighs> Uh, I feel like it's hard to tell. I feel like he's just doing whatever. Okay, and I feel yeah. like Viserion, like they're just doing their own thing. Like they don't have anybody to direct them. And we know like a dragon without a rider is dangerous. Yeah, right. That's a big <laughs> part. We got a lot of stories about that in like World of Ice and Fire and Fire and Blood. That was a, a decently, decently explored subtopic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this quote here, it says, dragons wheeled overhead, their shadows sweeping across the upturned faces of friend and foe alike. That really says it all. Like, no one knows what the hell they're going to do. Friend right. and foe. Like, who is friend and foe? Like, we don't even know who friend and foe in this context is. The dragons certainly don't. <laughs> like, they don't know who their friends and foes are to them. It's just they're not even thinking on those lines, I don't think. They're just like, well, we're dragons. We're flying around. Uh, food. Yeah. It's blood. Fire. Yeah. They're just kind of reacting. So. Yeah. Uh, and that line, wheeled overhead, that's a lot like the dream you cited, um, mm -hmm. which I was thinking of. I think it's similar language, uh, so it really calls that image up. One thing we've also gotten is ancient stories about how dragons look different from a distance. It's one of these things that comes up in relation to how long dragons have been around and, like, have dragons been in Westeros, like, way, way, way before the Targaryens, and then they died out again. Um, like, like this bit where Tyrion sees one of the dragons atop a pyramid, which is a crazy image a dragon on a pyramid like you could write a book on that symbolism i suppose but mm -hmm. he's all he can't tell which one it is he thinks it might he says it kind of from a distance it looks like an eagle and then we have this bit about Viserion's fires being pale which really c conjures up the pale fires from the forsaken chapter doesn't it did you do you think Ooh. do you think maybe that's a, a connection Viserion and and the pale fire woman in that vision or is that maybe uh have you given that much I thought I haven't given it much thought. I do like that. I just like when you said pale fire, I just thought, again, Viserion's going to get really hurt or killed in Marine. I missed that pale fire part the first time. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I like your idea about that. I got to think about that more. Like I hadn't considered Viserion like Viserion being hurt um, or, or worse. That's a great thought because you wonder, we've all kind of taken it for granted that there'll be three dragon riders. Um, the show kind of gave three dragon riders, but your Night King as a dragon rider is kind of like, uh, we're definitely not getting that, you know, in the book. <laughs> if yeah. there's a, we might get an undead dragon, but some, and, and there might, it might even be ridden by some other, but, uh, I don't know about I that. I could like this total tinfoil. I could see like Viserion getting injured, like Sunfire, Ooh. where like he's hurt really bad and she brings him with her to Westeros anyway. Oh yeah, that's interesting. I wonder. Yeah, that's a cool. Thought. And then tries yeah. to get him healed by like Melisandre or something. I don't oh. know. And then he becomes a shadow dragon. And not... <laughs> oh my! <laughs> There's that shadow dragon. We gotta we gotta accomplish tinfoil, that thread tinfoil. somehow. <laughs> yeah, the, the the shadow breathing dragon or whatever. That's gotta happen somehow. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, super chat from Glenn Thrasher. I don't see a question attached. Just sending some support, I suppose. Appreciate that, Glenn. Um, let's move on here. So as far as the Switch goes, I guess it's pretty straightforward, ultimately. Like, no one's surprised that they're switching back to Danny's side. No one's surprised that, that things have turned in that direction. Um, and no one's really surprised, given that so much has turned against the Yunkish, that the sellsword would be thinking of going back. However, there's still other considerations. For example, like, does Ben think that it's just going to be that simple? I don't think he does. He he knows that Danny promised to kill him, and Dario did too. So he's probably a little worried about maybe they just won't accept me back. That might be kind of on his mind. And not just that, but there's other people like Jorah and Tyrion. Do, do you have any thoughts in general on break them apart if you feel like it or or, or just speak to them as a group? Like Danny reaccepting Jorah and or Ben Plum and then just anything you want to say about what Danny might think about Tyrion uh, just off the cuff. So I think that Tyrion, I think she will accept Tyrion. I feel like um, Tyrion will be so helpful to her. Um, when it comes to Westerosi politics, he was hand of the king to Joffrey. Um, he's very, very smart. Um, I think she might forgive Jorah. Uh, I think it's very likely that she will forgive Jorah, but I'm concerned on Brown Ben. Um, okay. I've been back and forth on this. Like, part of me wants to say that she will forgive him, um, but I, I j I'm not sure about it. I. I think this may be like the first counsel that Tyrion gives her. Mm, okay. This may be her first counsel from Tyrion um, ever. <laughs> and I think what we would expect Tyrion, like we would probably expect Tyrion to say, yeah, forgive Brown Ben because um, I play Sivas with him a lot and I <laughs> like him. <laughs> yeah, what is she going to say? Yeah, it's like, um, yeah but I, <laughs> I actually um, don't think that Tyrion will for I, I think that Tyrion will counsel her not to forgive him. I think Tyrion is really detached. Um, he is admiring Tywin and he's probably thinking, you know, what would Tywin do in a situation like this? Oh. So I, I feel like he's treating his life kind of like a Sybass game right now and um, using his mind over emotions. And I think that Brown Ben might get the Janice Slint treatment. That's and from Tyrion. Idea. I like that idea a lot. Yeah, just like ruthless. Like, yeah, you want the second sons, but you don't want this current leader. Like, they will switch sides again if you don't, you know, if you don't take steps. That's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that'd be so cool. It's like, nah, Ben, thanks for everything, but <laughs> sorry, bro. We we can't. We got to go on without you. The, the The world has no place for you anymore. And one one thing I like about that too that that adds to it. Um, comes from a, a question or a comment we got from one of our flick commenters rolling knight who says think about Tyrion as the leader of the second sons not necessarily like as the captain in that sense but given that they uh he owes them all this money they're gonna do what he says to a certain degree and protect him to a certain degree because they want to cash in on that so it, it's almost like he may be able to maneuver it so that they're sort of like his his own men um especially if brown bends out of the way <laughs> so and and the con comparison i saw here that rolling knight made was blood raven and the raven's teeth and blood raven's already got a lot in common with Tyrion, just being disliked being handed the king and unpopular being kind of ruthless um you know kind of doing what it takes to get it done but not not worrying too much about what people think of you and that part working out very badly <laughs> because people think really bad of Tyrion and of blood raven so that's yeah. really cool i like that idea do you have anything I to add to that he kind of did that. That's kind of what he did in King's Landing with Janice Lent, like killed him and then put someone loyal to him in charge of the Golden Company. Or the, I mean, not the Golden Company, the, the Gold, gold Cloaks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, of course. The gold yeah. Cloaks. <laughs> but I feel like he's going to do something similar here. Like, bye bye, Brown Ben Plum. <laughs> that makes that's great. Yeah, I like. I, I have not heard that idea. I've thought of him taking when when Rolling Knight presented this idea of of the second son's being with Tyrion like that it made sense to me although my first impression was that the the clans of the Vale are also maybe could fall into that because he armed them but they're just mm -hmm. not very they're not professionals you know I mean they're great fighters but they're not like organized like that they don't necessarily you know they're not like a uh, used to taking orders like a sec like a group of sellswords are so but it could be both like Tyrion could just be building up this whole army of <laughs> his own guys here um 
Let's see. Next up. Yeah. And so another thing that happened was Ben. Remember, Ben tried to consider buying Jorah uh, to yeah. sell his head to Danny, uh, to give his head to Danny. So he was trying to win his way some favor. So he's trying to think of a way to get back with her. And you mentioned Jorah, like forgiving Jorah. I agree with that. I think Danny's probably going to forgive Jorah. And we've got a really cool idea as to one of the things that might help put Jorah back in Danny's good grace. We've got a great theory that's coming later in this episode, something we discovered from foreshadowing in this particular chapter that I'd never noticed before. So y'all, you're going to want to stay tuned for that, folks. Um, as far as other conflicts, while we're on the topic of reaccepting people or you know mending bridges or what have you, do you see anything in this chapter or just have thoughts going forward about Tyrion either facing his family, going against them and rolling into that, your idea of him thinking of himself as like a Sivas player? Like I kind of picture him playing Sivas against Jamie, um, but it's real armies, you know, on the board, kind of like what we saw in the TV show with them going against each other. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I do think that Tyrion is going to go against his family. Um, one thing the TV show didn't do really good is show like how much Tyrion is disassociated with Jamie at this point. Like Jamie, he is pissed off with Jamie yes. um, for the whole Taisha thing. And he's pissed off with Cersei. Like he, a lot of when he's in dance, he's dreaming of like killing Cersei. Mm -hmm. But I also think that there is going to, become a, come a point where Tyrion is going to be conflicted and I feel like that dream where he has two heads and one head is crying where he he's he's feeling like a black fire totally like he's feeling agree. like Maylees he's feeling yes. like a traitor so I do feel like while he is going to be this this tr uh, traitor air quotes to his family like he is going to become conflicted Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, he may be some of that emotional comeback. And I think that's something we see foreshadowed here as well. We'll, we'll get to this more specifically later in the, in the episode. But how he's, as you said, he's feeling some emotion, but mostly he's trying to block it out and he's mostly focusing on other things. And maybe that's part of why he gets so bottled up. Um, he gets yeah. so, he, that rage. It's like he's not processing um, it, at all. Yeah. So and, and other things, too. Obviously, obviously he's afraid. He's been drinking again. Yeah, I was going to say he's drunk as hell. <laughs> yeah, the alcoholism is a current, is a strong undertone that's really, you really got to be on your toes with that because it's not, it's, it's the nature of alcoholism is such that people are in constant denial about it. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for George to write Tyrion being aware of how big a problem it is for him. So we have to read between the lines. And when you're really aware of it, it's like when he's like, shouldn't we, shouldn't, don't we have any more wine? And Tenny's like, well, you drank it already. I mean, she sounds like the patient alcoholic, like wife of an alcoholic spouse, right? Uh, or wife of an alcoholic husband. Yeah. And just like explaining basic things to him. Like he's forgotten that he's drank that already. Like what? <laughs> like that's <laughs> he's like in his 20s. You're not supposed to forget you know, <laughs> what you just did a few minutes ago. <laughs> uh, so that's really that is pretty ominous. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. But yeah, it's definitely part of his state of mind. And uh, it really does feed into his whole blocking his emotion like alcohol. Obviously, it's, it's a, he's he's blocking himself out. Okay, so yeah. the battle. Um, first line. Somewhere off in the far distance, a dying man was screaming for his mother. Well, that's pretty grim. We've already talked about how this is going to get worse. We have battle, dead bodies, plague, dragons destroying things at random, starvation. It's just going to get worse, though, right? Like, this is... We expected to see stuff like this in Westeros, and we probably still will. But like Slaver's Bay, it's, it's awful, and it's probably just foreshadowing worse things in Westeros. Do you think it's going to get just completely were like i don't know how you could even describe it but do you <laughs> generally agree with that sentiment that it's just going to get yeah. so much worse yeah like i expect it to be bad like george doesn't glamorize battle it will be gruesome i don't know like how much worse it can get because it's really <laughs> really bad right now um though i guess what would make it worse is if we lose someone that we love Oh, yeah. Like a Sir Barristan, like if a Sir Barristan was to fall in battle. Yeah. It's hard to think of someone that's more likely to die that we would actually care about. I mean, maybe like one of Danny's handmaids. Like, I don't think Masande would die this soon. She's hardly started in, in the books as far as a character. Um, yeah. 
Erie and Jiki were killed off really early in the show, so maybe them. But I don't know if we're we're not as emotionally invested in them. Maybe some people are. You know, I like them a lot, but they don't get a ton of screen time, and we don't know much about their past, so it's harder to be invested in them. But yeah, yeah. you think Sebarrison may be the most likely? You think that's? Uh... Yes, Sebarrison is probably the most likely. Um, Jora, I think has has. I, Jora, I think, will be coming to Westeros with Daenerys. So I um, I think Jora's pretty safe at this point. But then that's the thing. Like with A Song of Ice and Fire, you should never feel like anyone's safe. <laughs> um, I feel, but I do feel like the dragons are, I feel like the dragons need, it needs to be shown to us fairly early that, that the dragons might not be as safe as we think they are. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, yeah, just like the show did that. I mean, maybe I don't necessarily like how the show did that, but it did capture that sense of, you know, this could just happen any moment. Yeah. Um, okay, so and then here, right, one of the things that's adding panic to the, the characters here that maybe we don't feel this because we know Danny is safe. Well, not safe, but we know she's not going to just die on the Dithraki Sea. And we know she's alive, unlike the characters in Marine who are some of them are just like telling themselves she's alive because they can't face the possibility that she isn't and Barrison is one of them but in general uh it's a huge problem like this i think about that opening quote screaming for his mother i'm like yeah they really need the mother of dragons here it's kind of like a meta comment there <laughs> if she was there a lot of people would have a lot more clear paths to make a decision at least they would know you know, well, I'm joining the side of a person who's alive. <laughs> like if some people are like, if I take Danny's side, am I joining the side of someone who's already dead? Uh, and that's difficult. So this is a really tough question. So maybe take it in any direction you want. Do you think that this interim is going to be extended like this time in Marine without Danny? Kind of feels like it's going to be a little while. Like, I mean, she's just now meeting Call Jacko on the Deathraki Sea and it feels like she's got some other things to do. So it could be a while. But what do you think? Um, yeah. So I think that um, it's I think we're going to be in Marine for a while. Like, I think wins is like the bring them home book. Oh. So I do think like the end of wins might end with like Danny on a ship seeing Westeros for the first time, but I don't expect her to be in Westeros at the ends of winds or in winds of winter at all, actually. Okay. Um, and I say this because like, she has to go like light her second fire. Yes. Cause I, I honestly think that the thing we saw in the show where she burns all the calls and like, all the callous arc I, I feel like that's real like that's book yeah, canon totally agree like something like that not exactly obviously but yeah, yeah not exactly but we have that house of the undying where she sees like the vision of the crones all kneeling to her yes so that's I, huge. I i do think that she, that has to happen before she co can come back to marine like and then when she gets back to marine she has to handle things there um if marine is like post battle when she gets back and a mess i feel like she's gonna want to fix it before she leaves i don't think she's just gonna leave and there's like some speculation that she might like go and wreck volantis yeah and like so i just i don't see her see leaving essos quickly in winds of winter and then there's or, pentos and to winds, deal with too right Even yeah and pentos that, yeah. <laughs> so much you're totally right you can, i agree with you there's a lot to do even if she handles them quickly even if she's like okay this is how we're handling marine this is one idea i had somewhat recently is the way she can handle marine is like okay look this doesn't work the slavers are terrible this whole part of the world is, is kind of messed up anyone who wants to who doesn't want to live here get on the ships let's all go like she does a nymeria kind of thing and just says except they actually know where they're going nymeria didn't know where she was going she's like we got to get the hell out of here danny's gonna have maybe more of a plan but it's still gonna be just look i can't stay this isn't gonna work let's just go <laughs> so, mm -hmm. like just get everyone on the ships and if the Vol volantis fleet shows up she might actually have enough ships to, to pull that off but with the iron fleet only no that's not enough so yeah you're right it's just really hard to conceive and how difficult to put it all together and to to make guesses that you can really feel confident in <laughs> yeah yeah so let's talk a little more about the fear that's being that the Tyrion is is discussing and and dealing with and, and how he applies it to other people around him too because as a future leader uh, a leader of men and someone who has already you know and someone who's already led men in the past understanding fear is really important because how his men in under his command respond to things managing morale 
Heck, Napoleon himself once said that morale is three times more important than any other factor in war put together. Like, and you're not going to argue with Napoleon about what works in war. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's still really interesting to draw these comparisons. Like Tyrion, as we said, we're more emotionally invested in him just because we've been through his shoes much longer. Barristan feels alive getting ready to fight. Victorian's downright lusty. Like he's like horny for battle. And Tyrion, but he's, like, afraid. Uh, And so here's a quote. Uh, High and shrill, his voice carried a long way in the morning air, far beyond his own encampment. Tyrion knew just enough Giscari to understand the words, but the fear in his voice would have been plain in any tongue. I know how he feels. Now, this is the guy shouting to horse, to horse. So he's, like, you know, someone shouting commands, but but his voice was breaking a little bit. So Tyrion is afraid because he's going into this battle, but he hears this scream from a distance, and do you think, uh, here's kind of a random question getting about Penny. This is, they're talking to each other and Tyrion's not processing his fear. Instead, he's talking about past battles sort of as a way to, I don't know, just a way to manage himself, a way to deal with his anxiety. What do you think about the way he's handling Penny in general? Obviously, I don't think there's some obvious criticisms we could make, but in terms of how he perceives protecting her. Do you think he's wrong to try to force her to, to accept the reality of the situation? Or maybe is it part of protecting someone, protecting them from even that knowledge, that anxiety? It's kind of a tough call. It, it is because I feel like it could go either way. Like it it's kind of wrong because I feel like he's mean to Penny, but I mean, he's, be, he's being nicer than he was. But I still feel like he's kind of spiteful <laughs> and yeah. mean yeah, because she's a dwarf him. like him. Yeah. And they have a like... I, I don't know. I just kind of, it's kind of hypocritical the way he treats Penny and like you're a dwarf too. Why are you treating her like this? <laughs> yeah. But I, I do think that, I do think that he is trying to protect her. Like he does want to protect her, but then like at times when he compares her to Shay, like I just don't understand that comparison at all. I don't mm. know what he's doing, like what's going on in his head that he would compare Penny to Shay. Yeah. Like when Penny tells him things and then he's like, well, Shay said something similar and she was a whore or whatever. Yeah, it says. doesn't. And, and, and there's really not that you're right. That's a, a topic we have in here as well uh, for further discussion. Let me let me actually jump ahead to that because this is a good we're, we're now that we're getting into it. It's pretty, pretty on point. Um find my place here uh yeah there's this theme of of sex and violence here that's really strong and it, we already just started with it mentioning victorian's feeling of lust and and le- to a lesser extent barrison feeling alive and Tyrion thinks you never forget your first which is that's the way that's worded in a way to think of losing your virginity or your first sexual experience whatever whatever phrase works for you there and that same language is used by victorian he says he thought of his first chip of his first woman like it's back to back so and then here we have Bakoko uh, kissing and fondling his lover. And Nina reminds us that sex and violence are openly combined in Dothraki culture, which Danny is, you know, is and was quite involved with. And Nina also added a great point to add to what you're saying here. He says he's not wrong. Tyrion is not wrong that Shay probably never loved him. He paid her to be his girlfriend and she accepted that. But he's gone too far in the other direction now he thinks Shay had been making it all up when she said she was scared because she had pleasured him for half the night. That's just not fair. It's like mm-hmm. the pendulum has swung too far. Tyrion's realizing a lot of that was fantasy, but he's now he's just accusing Shay of all these things that are just not uh, reasonable. Like he, she's got to, she's trying to survive. Like he's not, he's not accepting that really important truth. And that's also true with Penny that they're just trying to survive in this very patriarchal world with no one like championing them and um nina also points out that shay woke him up like Tyrion was thinking huh i had to wake podrick up because he was like but shay woke him up <laughs> like he, <laughs> she was the first one awake <laughs> like that like she she should get some credit for that right like if he's, yeah. if he's if he's criticizing podrick who's his squire like then hey good job shay like you're the first one like up so uh, and like you said, P- Tyrion's bitter that Shay called him fearsome because she was. He now thinks of that as mockery, like of my, you know, my, my giant of Lannister. So maybe one way we can reconcile all this, because I do think Tyrion has learned a few things about being poor, about being downtrodden. Is at least learned that, but I don't think he's made a separation between men and women. I think he kind of lumps everyone together and doesn't realize that. 
women face a much different set of challenges. So maybe maybe that's what he hasn't learned. If he's maybe learned what it's like to be poor and enslaved, but he hasn't learned the empathy uh, on this way. Like he hasn't learned what it's like to, to face the challenges as a woman. And he doesn't seem to be showing any of that learning either. Do you, you think that's maybe a good way to put it? Or do you have any? I mean, I, yeah, I, I think that's a great way to put it. And I think that he will learn the the differences and challenges that it's being a woman when he is working with Daenerys closely. Mm, someone that because, he actually does have to respect. Yeah, someone that he respects that is not going to be welcomed. Like he might see Daenerys, well, we don't know like for sure, like if he's going to love Daenerys or if she's going to be problematic for him. Mm -hmm. We don't know what he's going to feel, but like, let's say for example, like he does love her and come, like he looks at her as like this new hope um, for the future. And then he sees that like these people in Westeros don't respect her. And he sees like what she goes through in Marine as just being a woman. Mm. I think maybe that would, because he doesn't respect Cersei and, no. and as, as bad as the person as Cersei is like Cersei goes through a lot of the things that she goes through. Cause she's a woman. Yeah. And he's never really had a, a, a strong, like quality female role model. Like that's something we maybe take for granted is Tyrion didn't ne never met his mother. And that's usually like the number one woman in most people's lives that like helps you to learn to respect women. If you're a man, uh, if, yeah. if it's not being taught to you by, you know, your, your elders aren't just imparting that on you. Some people just learn that naturally by having, by loving their mother. Right. And Tyrion just doesn't have that. And it's really hard for not everyone. I mean, some of you out there know what Tyrion's going through to, on some level, but most of us, we can't conceive of that. We don't know what it's like to have that. To, to have experienced the opposite, that other, you know, way of being. And yeah. uh, so I think you're right about Daenerys. It's really interesting to think about, is he going to respect her or is he going to also lust for her? Because that's how he interacts with so many women. He hasn't had like healthy relationships with women, like ever. Um, like, ever. Like, yeah, Cersei, <laughs> terrible relationship, you know, not entirely his fault. Of course, she's terrible. She was the elder. She treated him horribly from the second he was born. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Um, and no mother around to raise him. No grandmother, presumably, that, like, that's been mentioned. I'm pretty sure she's been gone. She thinks she was dead before he was around. So, yeah, there's just no... Uh, nursemaids and servants those were the women around him when he was a kid and and that's obviously not going to help his con conception of, of respecting women when he's this powerful you know uh, lord of casterly rock uh, son of etc so yeah so there's a lot to work with there um do you think this foreshadows more uh troubling violence in the future like in, in the future do you think Tyrion's gonna use his position with danny to execute revenge and and get people back for what they did to him or do you think maybe he'll step back from that cliff it, this sort of touches on what we we're talking about with him fighting his own family but this is more along the lines of just kind of the innocence out there i think um yes like i think at first he will be like um revenge uh for cersei mm. um for his, for his whole family um everything that anyone's ever done to him i feel like he's going to be about revenge but i i also feel like he's just going to be ruthless hmm. i feel like he's going to be ruthless um i feel like he's gone down a very dark path um i don't feel like he's going to be ruthless to the point where he can't come back around but i do feel like he's going to be ruthless and i feel like that that's going to be something that daenerys is going to like about him oh yeah, because she needs um, a little of that. Maybe not too much, but yeah, lack of ruthlessness has definitely been hurting her in Marine. Yeah, I feel like he's going to be the ends justify the means kind of person. Like mm -hmm. Tywin, I feel like that's why he's talking about Tywin with such admiration at the start of this chapter. Mm -hmm. And throughout this chapter, I feel like he's going to really um, be Tywin-esque. Just, Machiavellian. Yeah, just do what needs to be done. Be a rock about it. Be casterly rock. Um, yeah, and yeah. I, that's a great point, too, because if Danny's just so frustrated with Marine, if anyone can come in and just make headway and cut through that mirror and he's not <laughs> and, and yeah. solve these problems, she's going to be grateful or at least be like, well, I need this guy. Like, I don't have anyone like this. And we've we talked about that as Janos Slint, like Tyrion gets in. You mentioned Janos Slint. Tyrion gets involved in King's Landing 
and he's immediately starting to make moves and sussing things out really accurately, figuring out who's his enemy, who's not. Danny wasn't able to do any of those things when she got to Marine because she didn't know to. She's not, she didn't have that experience. She's not a, she's not an intriguer. That's not her skill set really. But um, Tyrion could show her uh, what's what, and and we could see some Tyrion going up against Varys uh, later down the line when there's a, <laughs> a battle of intriguers. That's a little off topic maybe, but I think uh, it's fun to think about. Um, okay, so let's let's see here. Let me get back to the battle. We talked about Tyrion's conflict. A little more about the uh, the armor stuff. That's part of what compares them. Is the the there's a lot of discussion of armor in this chapter, and some of it's uh, mm -hmm. I guess symbolic of you know what you present to the world and and how you frame yourself and uh, things like that. Like Tyrion thinks a lot about his father's armor, like how huge it was and how much it added to his mystique it's like the trappings of power that melisandre and euron both go on and on about and in this case it certainly does work i mean he it's burned into his mind this image of his dad in this epic armor just sitting over the battlefield but we have so much of this Tyrion remembers shay helping him get armored in green at the green fork and now uh, penny's helping him get armored here and at the end of the chapter he gets a new breastplate from you know with the erotic breastplate guy's armor and yeah. victorian is getting armored by the dusky woman in his chapter and barristan's armor is cited at the beginning of his chapter and heck euron's armor in, <laughs> in aaron's chapter i mean i don't really know what to make of all this i just think it's a it's a maybe it's just because people are getting ready to go to battle, of course, they're putting armor on. But I feel like there's some deeper meaning to it. But I can't really put my finger on it. Maybe you can't either, but I wanted to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't thought about it. I haven't thought about it. But um, it's just tricky, like off it? the top of my head, off the top of my head, we're hearing all about this armor, 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 armor. Maybe it's no, that's stupid. I don't know. <laughs> I was gonna yeah, say maybe you're stuck maybe like it's me. Foreshadowing, like the, the dragons need armor, <laughs> like mm. dragon armor or something's gonna come. I don't know. Um, it that's really crazy, but I mean, maybe it is just because we're going to war. Yeah, I mean, it's time. It's time to to not be who you are. Time to put on your. You can't be people. Can't be people anymore. They have to be uh, avatars of themselves. You know, avatars of their house. Tywin's armor is very lion esque. I mean, it's it's all lions. And Barristan's armor is is a dragon helm, and Victorian's armor is Kraken armor, and Tyrion doesn't have his his own armor. He doesn't have his lion armor, so he's maybe not a lion right now. And then he becomes, then he gets erotic breastplate man's armor, which is like, what does yeah. that mean? <laughs> it's like that that well, really fits in with his depravity and his you know trouble with relating to women. <laughs> and kind yeah, of well, he had a he had a mismatched armor on a green fork. You have that on here, and That's then now true. miss, and then he trades that armor in for his lion armor, his hand of the king armor, and now he has mis mismatched armor again. Yeah. So maybe he's going to trade that in for hand of the queen armor. Hmm. I don't know. It is a lot of armor talk. There's a lot of identity. Well, anyway, well, it's uh, something to keep in the back of your minds. Those of you commenting or listening later, feel free to send us thoughts on that one. It's it's got us somewhat stumped. Maybe some of y'all will have some insight there. But sticking on the topic of armor, here is something that I'm pretty excited about, uh, a prediction <laughs> that I think feels pretty good. Let me uh, run through it here. Um, a lot of you all will recall, at the end of A Dance with Dragons, we were joking about a certain character's new armor. And uh, let's see here. I think we've discovered how Victorian will die. And I didn't mention this last time because I hadn't realized it yet. First of all, we'll start with Tyrion throwing shade at his fellow Battle of Fire POV companions here. Quote, a younger man might have found it all exhilarating. A stupider man might have thought it grand and glorious right up to the moment when some arse ugly yunkish slave soldier with rings in his nipples planted an axe between his eyes. Okay, so the first part, a younger man might have found it all exhilarating. Well, that's pretty much on the nose for how Barristan feels, right? As they're opening the gates to charge, he says, The air tasted strangely sweet. There is nothing like the prospect of death to make a man feel alive. So that's Barristan for you. So it's kind of a joke because Barristan is clearly not a younger man. He's a much, much older man. But Barristan does still fight like a young man. And he's been in love with battle since he was called the bold at age 10. <laughs> so there's that. But the second part, it says, A stupider man might have thought it grand and glorious. 
That's clearly Victorian. He's thinking, you know, like a nod to Victorian, who is clearly a stupider man. And Victorian has thought a restlessness was in him, a hunger for the dawn and the things this day would bring, death or glory. I will drink my fill of both today. So that is totally on the nose. But the last part, right up till the point where an arse ugly younger slave soldier with rings in his nipples planted an axe between his eyes. Now, who was it we were joking about that has nipples in his rings in his armor? That's Jorah. Jorah literally walked up with nipple ring armor at the end of A Dance with Dragons. And he's definitely an arse ugly Yunkish slave soldier. He was just <laughs> escaped from uh, Yezen's Okegas along with Tyrion and Penny. And he's as ugly as they get. Like, people describe him as ugly before he was beaten up and had a face brand. So he's extremely ugly. So that really fits. <clears throat> and so that's just a perfect description of Jorah. Arse ugly, sold as a fighter to Yezan, who was Yunkish, and uh, so ugly that he's unrecognizable. And so, and with the nipple rings comment. <laughs> so uh, the, the line was, the nipples on his muscled breastplate had a pair of iron rings through them. That's the actual line. So Jorah is a sword guy, not an axe guy. So that part doesn't fit, but whatever. Maybe he'll take Victorian's axe from him while fighting and hit him in the head with it. And really, this fits super well if you think about it too, because who would get who would be madder than Jorah Mormont if he found out some ironborn guy was trying to kidnap and, and rape Daenerys? Like, who would freak out more than than Jorah? Even Danny wouldn't freak out as much as Jorah would. So mm -hmm. And also Jorah has a, rep, a history with the Ironborn, right? He was at Pike during Balon's Rebellion. He was That's where he got his knighthood. And Tyrion knows all this too. So uh, now that I've ratted all it off, what do you think? Are you buying this? Victorian killed by Jorah? Yep, I'm buying it. <laughs> I, I, I'm 100% buying it. Um, I told you, like when I seen it in the document, I was like, oh, that makes so much sense. And then there's like that whole thing with Danny at the House of the Undying with the corpse on the prow of a ship could totally be victorian oh yeah because gray joy gray lips smiling sadly yeah, there's, that's that's a really good yeah. gray lips thing because we like people think it could be theon it could be john connington because he's got gray scale but they all it's like yep but we've cited we've been citing victorian as a possibility for that you know for a long time too so yes totally agree um, so that could be neat I, i'd like to see that fight <laughs> that could be a good one <laughs> yeah i feel like it's too it's it has too much the nipple rings, a stupider man. Victorian is stupid as hell. Like George has said, like, I forget the exact quote, but George has said, like, he's, he's dumb as a dumb stump, as, I think. Yeah, yeah, dumb as a stump. <laughs> dumb as a stump. That's awesome. Okay, so moving on from nipple rings to bells. That's another, like, thing. I don't know what to call. But bells are obviously a thing we've all, like, when any, anyone who started to reread after seeing the end of the show was, was a little more aware of bells and wondering how this is all going to play out and whether it probably has more to do with John Connington and his, his obsession with the Battle of the Bells. But this could all play together somehow. And of course, Danny with the Dothraki and the Bells of Victory in their hair. Like, that's a big thing in the books that's not in the show at all. So, uh, and that's mentioned here with by Brown Ben saying, look, there's no bells. I hear no bells. That's he's not a clearly not a slave. <laughs> so that's also like a perspective thing. Right. So bells are victory. But here they're a sign of slavery. So like, wh uh, what do you make of all this stuff with bells and Daenerys? Have you come uh, up with any new thoughts after seeing the end of the show and reconsidering the whole bell <laughs> stuff? Or or is it just just a big mess? I don't know. <laughs> um. So season eight, like with the bells tolling and King's Landing and Daenerys just freaking out, like I thought that made no sense at all. <laughs> like I'm not even going to like, just, I thought it made no sense. Um, so I, I don't know if the bells uh parallel, like with slavery and then with the Dothraki victory, that bells is supposed to mean like, the Dothraki are somehow enslaved to Daenerys. Like if, mm. if the Dothraki come back with Danny as like this oh. stallion who mounts the world figure, are they somehow supposed to be enslaved? By? Like, is that, is that what they're, they could be pointing at? I don't really know. I like that but I idea just, a lot. I don't think bells and Danny really correlate together. For yeah, me, it, like for me, it seems more like a John Connington thing. Like he's the one who obsesses yeah. over it. Danny just, Con just a Connington. Kind of yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, they just uh, he just Danny just kind of thinks about them every once in a while. She doesn't really 
you know, in, uh, get really deep into that. It's it's you're right. It's John Connington who does that. Hmm. Yeah, he obsesses. Yeah, he really does. <laughs> one one idea that we've discussed a lot on this show, and um, you've probably discussed it as well elsewhere, um, the idea that Danny will be blamed for what John Connington does. That could kind of re- uh, mm. rectify what the show did, kind of get us sort of along the same lines there, um, which would explain why it just doesn't make sense, the show's version, because it's like, well, how did... That's the missing piece, that it's it wasn't, it wasn't her in the first place. It was someone else, yeah. <laughs> and that she gets blamed for it. Uh, so that for me, that works. I don't know if that works for you, but at least that would at least make a lot more sense. Yeah. Like, I feel like the whole thing with season eight was that Aegon was missing. Yeah. Yeah. You could really you really but, felt that loss, huh? Yeah, I felt it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a bigger plot line than people are thinking. It also had the side effect of some people thinking that, oh, if they got rid of that plot, it must not be that important. I'm like, eh, I wouldn't go that far. They, yeah. they clearly got rid of other important things. So I don't think that argument necessarily works. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, what are you going to tell me? Stoneheart wasn't important either. I mean, maybe, but I don't think so. I don't agree with that. So, yeah, there's just lots of examples. We don't have to we don't have to hammer at the show here. Um, but also the. Well, let me back up just a little bit. There's we talked about the idea, which your idea that I really like that Tyrion will just simply do away with Brown Ben as a way to deal with this problem. Well, there's something pretty cool here that signifies perhaps that it needs to be done. Uh, here's a quote. Brown Ben Plum wore plate and mail over boiled leather. Oh, hey, look, more armor descriptions. <laughs> <laughs> the silk cloak flowing from his shoulders was his only concession to vanity. It rippled when he moved, the color changing from pale violet to deep purple. Okay, when a cloak changes color, turns color, your symbolism w- alarm bells should go off. And be like, turn okay, cloak. turn cloak, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then so you just look a little closer and you say, hmm, okay, pale violet to deep purple. Well, Danny's eyes are pale violet. Aegon's eyes are deep purple. So mm-hmm. the color changed from pale violet to deep purple. So is this, this fits pretty well with what we were discussing before. Do you think the second sons are maybe set to betray Danny again? Does this, does this tell us they will betray Danny or that maybe this is why Tyrion needs to do it? Maybe, uh, maybe try to rectify these two things. Um, I think they, I think they will. Um, well, I don't want to say they will. I think Tyrion knows that they could because once a turn cloak, always a turn cloak. Mm -hmm. Um, but Tyrion knows about Aegon, which Danny doesn't. Huge factor. So that's a huge factor that Tyrion knows he exists. And, Brown Ben Plum, I could totally see him going whichever way the wind blows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And and um, the uh, ooh, what was I going to say? Your the thing about him knowing about Aegon, yeah, that gives him an interesting uh, piece of knowledge that he can. No, that's another thing he can worm his way in with Danny. Be like, look, I know all about this this other dragon, you know, this this claimant. I, you know, I definitely him. think that's foreshadowing because that's too. That's too on the nose coloring, eye coloring. Yeah, if it's like, just like, why pick yeah. those two specific? That that's exactly how their eyes are described. Yeah, that, that can't be a coincidence, right? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, I don't okay. Believe in coincidences. No, yeah, not from George. They, with with George, a coincidence. It's like, oh, only one out of ten of these is a coincidence, or, or the other way around. Like in the real world, it's like, oh, it's this is a coincidence. This is a conspiracy. But in the in a literary series, when someone wrote it. Nah, <laughs> it's, it's intentional. It's more like the other way. It's more likely yeah. to be intentional than a coincidence. In the real world, this would be a coincidence. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see. <clears throat> Jumping around a bit. Let's talk about um, a little more about the battle itself. And here's a cool uh, talking maybe a little bit about the horn um, and some other characters that may have issues with each other. So the dragons are the 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 trebuchet stuff that starts that's one of the first things we see in this chapter and this ties us in really nicely to barristan's final dance with dragons chapter which that's the last thing that starts happening is the corpses start flying and that's probably right around where Tyrion one is if we're guessing what's going on in that chapter because the Tyrion isn't like he does not acting like this is something he's seeing for the first time it seems like just like the dragons it's like he's already he's experienced this at least one chapter ahead um by the way, can't help myself here. The way those trebuchets are serving up meals to the dragons, they may as well be trebuchet chefs. Oh. <laughs> uh, p- pale dead birds, George describes them as. These burning corpses. Like, 
I can't not think of the wall and like the undead over there and the fact that um, Danny's just had like that wall scene with the tiny wall and the ants at the end of the book uh. as well. And there's just so many, there's just, George is doing so much to connect what's going on at the wall to what's going on with Danny, like leadership themes with John and Danny, just things falling apart. They can't control all these. There's too much to handle. They're too young and inexperienced, but they've just got the the right attitude, like at the core, like their, their, their goodness really shines through. Um, so I, that's a big deal. Do you see, what do you think about these parallels and, and these themes coming together? Because I think it really meets up with what you were saying before about, Winds of Winter is going to be the book that brings them all together or brings them all home. And I think A Dance of Dragons sets that up with these POVs ending up in all of the same places. Like everyone's either at the Wall, Slaver's Bay, or King's Landing, or just like a couple other places like the Stormlands and maybe yeah. Dorne. So uh, that I mean, I, Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I've, I've been rambling I, too long here. <laughs> no, you're fine. I, I really like that he that he's doing that. But I wonder about the bodies like pale... What is it? Pale dead Pale birds? dead birds. Yeah, well, very specific, right? I, I like. Are we gonna get like some wicked sister trebuchet throwing whites over the wall? Whoa! At some point, like, like say, like say, some point in the book, the battle is done, and they will just start flinging dead bodies <laughs> over the wall. Wow! Like, could you? See- <laughs> Can you see that? That would be that's a really long way to launch. That wall is tall. Yeah, that is kind of tall. (laughs) Still, it could maybe happen. I don't know. (laughs) But but it's it is interesting, like that she sees the ants going over like the wall in that when she's having that little berry quest. And I also do think I do think like there's definitely a parallel there. I don't really know the purpose that it's there for, other than to say, you know, these this is where the this is where she's going. Hmm. Um this is where this is where Daenerys is going. So I definitely think like Daenerys is going to the wall. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's gonna be neat to see that. <laughs> like breathing <laughs> fire down on like one one thing I imagine is maybe not the corpses flying, although I've tried to think about how that could be happening. One thing that comes to mind is them just jumping off the cliff at hard home, but I don't think we'll see that. But it just mm-hmm. you know, it came to mind since it's bodies flying. Um, but the idea that they're just gonna crawl up the wall in great numbers like ants or spiders, right? And that Oh yeah kind of like what we saw the free folk do at the battle of the wall when they're just like charging and then climbing the wall which is maybe a little silly that people would do that but undead doing that would be fitting that would be totally um workable and uh interesting and terrifying <laughs> <laughs> terrifying like i feel like when's a winner is just gonna be like on its own could just be a horror book yeah right <laughs> so much suffering it's gonna be insane amounts of suffering we're just like laughing about it because it's not real and because it's it's hard to face like as if it was real <laughs> so yeah. yeah let's let's keep it let's keep that uh <laughs> in that bubble there let's not <laughs> make it too real um Interesting writing here. This is an extended quote about the sounds of battle, which I think is pretty important because music, it is the song of ice and fire after all. George uses sounds as metaphors for music and vice versa. And of course, given the title of the series, it's a, it's an important thing. In fact, this line ends with that connection or this quote ends with that with that uh, merging of themes. Trumpets were blowing along the Skahazadan, war horns answering from the walls of Marine. A ship was sinking in the river mouth of fire. Dead men and dragons were moving through the sky, whilst warships crashed and clashed on Slaver's Bay. Tyrion could not see them from here, by, but he could, but what? But he could hear the sounds, the crash of hull against hull as ships slammed together, the deep-throated war horns of the Ironborn and queer high whistles of Karth. The splintering of oars, the shouts and battle cries, the crash of axe on armor, sword on shield, all mingled with the shrieks of wounded men. Many of the ships were still far out in the bay, so the sounds they made seemed faint and far away. But he knew them all the same. The sounds of slaughter. It's like that um, Garfunkel, Simon and Garfunkel song, The Sound of Silence, but <laughs> The Sound of Slaughter. So yeah, like you said, there's a lot of Blackwater parallels here, and that's fitting because Tyrion's been in both. I mean, you got multiple sides, multiple POVs. You got dragons instead of wildfire, battle on land and sea. But the sounds is the thing that really draws my attention. He, he hears elephants. He hears other horns. He even hears specifically hears ironborn horns. What I think this is telling us is that he's got all these specific horns he's heard. Clearly, the dragon horn has not been heard because that would really stand out amidst all these other things that he's able to differentiate. 
So if he can hear these other things so precisely, I think we would know for sure if the horn was blown, which leads me to a question. And I'm going to ask this to almost all the different guests we have uh, for the Battle of Fire episodes. Any idea what's going to happen when the horn blows? Any guesses, any theory, whatever you think? Um, it's hard, isn't it? I hope. <laughs> I'll tell you what I hope happens. Okay. I hope nothing. I hope nothing happens. Oh, Jet Magician had that idea, too. Like, just I wonder if nothing will happen. I like it. I like it. Yeah, like, I, I don't want anybody to be able to control the dragons but Daenerys. Like, <laughs> I, I don't want anyone to be able to, like, you know, control the dragons. So, and, and I, I think McCorrell tells Victoria, I'm like, you need to claim this in, in blood. Yeah. blood. So he has to like sacrifice. He, he doesn't, he's not supposed to blow the horn himself. Yeah. So I'm wondering like, who does he get to blow the, like, I feel like Victorian is too stupid to know what to do with that horn. <laughs> yeah, and it, he's and he's rubbing his own blood on it. Yeah, it's like, that's not going to work, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's just going to be useless to him. Like, it could be but, disappointing if nothing happens, but I think if jo I think maybe that's underestimating George. Like, George could do it in a way that it's like, wow, it's actually really cool that nothing happens. Because I was thinking about that at first. I'm like, J Joe Magician suggested maybe, maybe it'll be too much of a letdown if nothing happens. But maybe, maybe that's selling George short. Maybe he could do that in a way that works. Maybe it will harm Viserion. Oh, I swear. I think combining your theories. Happen. Yeah, it could. I think something's going to happen to Viserion. I'm so scared. <laughs> well, let's talk about why you think that. Let's, that's a good idea to segue to this this chess piece, the Sivas piece that after this breastplate messenger guy is killed, his blood spills on the ground and it's very symbolic. There's blood and roses, black and red. So it's Targaryen slash Euron colors. And the line is, the white Sivas dragon ended up at Tyrion's feet. He scooped it off the carpet and wiped it on his sleeve. But some of the Yunkish blood had collected in the fine grooves of the carving. So the pale wood seemed veined with red. So yeah, there's a lot going on there. You got Bloodraven <laughs> and Bl Bran because of the white wood white pale wood and then you got weir wood yeah right and then you got the Tyrion wipes some of the blood on himself which might mean something do you think this is Tyrion riding a dragon foreshadowing or bran riding a dragon or one idea i heard <laughs> that's interesting is Tyrion helped bran with a saddle riding helped him learn to ride is it possible that that idea will be inverted and bran using his skin changing powers will help Tyrion learn how to ride a dragon or is that just a little too much for you for me personally i don't think Tyrion's gonna ride a dragon i okay. don't want to i don't want to see him ride a dragon and i don't think he's a targ i know like okay. it's very popular but just me personally i don't think that he is um i think he's definitely tywin's son okay. <laughs> um but I do think that Tyrion is going to have a relationship with the dragons just because he loves dragons so much. So I could see Tyrion um, kind of trying to figure out who could ride these dragons. Hmm. Oh, he could be helping like maybe the, the call for dragon riders. Thing Dra like dragon, like, like a dragon seed Rhaenyra kind of yeah. thing. I could see Tyrion like facilitating that. Um, but I don't necessarily see Tyrion riding a dragon. Okay. I don't see Bran warging a dragon. Like I think if Bran tried to warg a dragon, his brain would melt or something. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> or the dragons would. <laughs> yeah. Like <laughs> one way or the other. Yeah. Something fire and happen. ice. <laughs> Too much. That's a good idea. I, and I'm glad you brought up um, the idea of, uh, well, I'm, uh, no, I'm spacing out. I'm glad you brought up the uh, the the idea of um, Tyrion and the dragon seeds because most one general rule I have: if George brings up a big historical event in like the Dance of Dragons or histor or just other important times, there's a decent chance he's foreshadowing it happen happening in a da uh, the main series. A good example is there were two huge great councils in history one of them was overseen by blood raven and of course that's how the show ends with a great council and so we were over here on history of western i'm sure we weren't the only ones but we were adamant there was going to be a great council because it was 
such a big deal in history, discussed so much. So it seems like that's going to be something that has to happen in, in, in the Song of Ice and Fire as well. And so that brings us to the Dragon Seeds. The Dragon Seeds were a huge deal during the Dance with the Dragon. It's a huge plot line. But I struggled to see how that could come up in A Song of Ice and Fire. Like, are they going to put out a call for people? And they could. Um, but which dragon will it be? Would that be Viserion or Rhaegal? Or, I mean, I guess it would have to be Rhaegal. I don't suppose anyone's ever going to try to ride Drogon until... Yeah, this no, books nobody are over at most, <laughs> if ever, you know. <laughs> yeah, nobody can ride Drogon, but I think it would be like Viserion and Rhaegal. I don't necessarily think that Viserion's gonna die in Marine. I think he's gonna be get hurt, hmm. and it's gonna show us. Um, and I think he's gonna be hurt badly, like Sunfire. And I agree with you that there are there are a lot of parallels, like with the history. Like, um, I feel like the burning of Harrenhal with Aegon, Aegon with Aegon burning Harrenhal. I feel like that's something that might Ooh. come back around. Yeah. Um, the Black the reaping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the reaping. I also feel like a lot of the Blackfire rebellion, just the idea, like, I feel like Aegon already makes that yeah. a thing. Like Aegon being a piece on this board makes the Blackfire rebellions at like, the, the parallel parallel with this with a song of ice and fire so i guess this just real quick then while we're on that topic to you since we you're you've weighed in on Tyrion's parentage and his dragoning or or lack thereof do you think uh <laughs> you think so you think aegon is a black fire or do you think there's a chance he's really rhaegar's son i think that he's not rhaegar's son okay yeah that's that's pretty much how <laughs> most of us over here feel that way too certainly i do um, and, and having gone through this reread, it, it only made that more solid. <laughs> that, yeah. that, so there's still a chance, but that's definitely where I fall. Um, yeah. Okay, let's see. What else do we have here? A few more questions and a few other subtopics. Um, okay, so back to Tyrion and him uh, and his mindset. Certainly, I agree that he's blocking a lot of this out, not processing. And he's also just down on himself. Like there's this one line that's really dark uh what a fraud you are imp you let a hundred guardsmen rape your wife shot your father through the belly with a coral twisted a golden chain around your lover's throat until her face turned black yet somehow you still think that you deserve to live yeah that's definitely not the kind of thoughts you have when you have you know high self-esteem or feel good about yourself but it comes from this previous moment where he's all the fear, all the notion that he's in battle and thinking back on falling into the uh, the sorrows and all these other things that reminded him that he actually did want to live. And this is his response to himself saying, okay, you want to live, but you don't deserve it. Now, this gets us back to that moment with uh, where he's pro where we're, we're processing all these different factors like his hatred towards his family, alcoholism, and his general inability to interact with uh, a lot of people. Um, and, and as we've maybe highlighted women, particularly even more. Um, do you think, uh, uh, by the way, comment from tree girl, Penny is really good in this chapter. Shout out to her. She claps back him accurately, like shares his jokes even, and has to deal with him being drunk. So good on Penny for that. Um, so to add to what we've already said uh, about this, what do you think, do you think maybe the dragons are a thing that can help him get out of this funk? Or do you think there's some other thing that can give him purpose besides, you know, the thought of revenge? Is there any way he could find love or any other positive things in his life? And if you have predictions for Penny, that would be pretty relevant right here as well. Um, I don't have any Penny predictions, really. But with Tyrion, I feel like he lost purpose i kind of feel like he never really had purpose okay yeah hmm. well he had he had purpose but i feel like he when he killed tywin when he found out about taisha like they even say it in this chapter like you never forget your first yeah. or Tyrion says that and and like he spent all a dance like wondering where do whores go and it's like i i kind of want like i i hope for Tyrion to find taisha uh, like, let, let's say Tyrion becomes the hand of Daenerys, which, which I, I do believe he will become. The, you're going to hear a lot of rumors about Tyrion all through 
Essos and Westeros, like just like you do with Daenerys. So maybe Tysha hears that and she comes to find Tyrion, or maybe just the idea that of dragons makes Tyrion believe in the impossible. And I, I do like really hope for Tyrion to get his dream life that he has with Braun in Game of Thrones with Braun, where he's like, I want to die at the age of 80. Watching- <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the quote, you guys know. The quote. I hope yeah, that yeah. For- and I, I do think the dragons are going to pull him out of the, I, and not just the dragons, but the mother of dragons. Cause at the beginning of this chapter, there's a dying man crying out for his mother. Yeah. Experience never had a nurturing woman in his life. Yeah. I think that that opening line does a lot of subtle work all by itself. You, you, I, I thought of connecting it to Danny, but you just mm-hmm. connecting it to Tyrion and him not having his mother. That's huge, right? Like he's thinking of a person calling for their mother, but he would never do that because he never met his mother. And that's just like a, just a tiny little another needle in him that mm-hmm. like the world how different the world is for him like how hard it is for him to interact with people and feel like connections with other people because even that even that normal thing that almost everyone else has he doesn't have he's Um, gonna get one though the mother he's gonna get a mother mother of dragons that's great that is really neat (laughs) i never thought about it that way that that she'll be kind of like that it's funny to think too because she's a lot younger than him (laughs) but of course that's true for everyone basically that she's mother of dragons to all these people and is younger than all of them except like Masande, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of Braun, I'm glad you mentioned Braun because <laughs> there's a couple of great this this chapter is so chock full of like little nods and references and and funny like ironies. Uh, for Braun, he thinks Sir Braun of the Blackwater. Now, unless my sisters killed him, that might not be quite so simple as she thinks. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. <laughs> she did take him too lightly, didn't she? <laughs> Spent I, and like, yeah. <laughs> or really, what was it? Buy him a birch, sir. Buy him or whatever that guy was. That guy, Balman Birch. That's his name. Yeah. That guy really took Braun too lightly. <laughs> yes, I mean, and it, it's interesting. Like Tyrion knows Cersei that well that she know that he knows that Tyrion is gonna t- that Cersei was gonna try to kill Braun, and he knows Braun well enough to know it wasn't going to be easy and it wasn't <laughs> Braun would have sussed that out too Braun's not going to be like well Tyrion's gone oh well I don't have anything to worry about nope <laughs> so yeah he's like Lord Stokeworth now <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I really Mary wonder about Flawless. that yeah so we mentioned the the Vale clansmen that might hook up with Tyrion again and we mentioned the second sons maybe and of course Braun that's that's ready-made uh lord potentially to join him as well but maybe not Braun's got his own his own things to do maybe <laughs> uh another parallel character mention here thinking of speaking of Braun now I don't think Braun and no Braun and Podrick do interact a little bit in the books, not very much, but in the show they have their their funny moments. So segueing to Pod, Tyrion thinks of Podrick. A great irony here. I hope he found a better man to serve. Man? No. A better, better? Woman. <laughs> Oh yes. <laughs> And you never, also that line, you never forget your first applies here too, because that was also Podrick's first battle, the Battle of the Green Fork, and Tyrion was his first master. And Tyrion is, and Podrick has not forgotten that Tyrion abandoned him. That is, that is too bad. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Podrick is, is, I kind of, do you, do you ever think about what might happen if Podrick and Tyrion like meet again? Because I kind of think it will happen, don't you? I do think it will happen. I haven't gave, uh, given it much thought, but I would like to think that. I would like to think that Tyrion. I, I would like to think it would be. Uh, it wouldn't be like a bad reunion. Okay. Yeah. Do you? What do you think? What's that? I said I think Pod will have vouch for her. Shaya thinks Pod maybe will vouch for Tyrion's character and saying, "Okay, we'll mm-hmm. do this and this." And he did treat you know, other than leaving him, uh, he did treat Podrick pretty well. Yeah. Uh, certainly better than you could have expected from a lot of people. Um, Let's see. A uh, great catch by Joe Buckley here. Uh, remember that Barristan's plan through Galaza Galari, the Green Race, was to make a big offer of cash to the Yunkish with the sellswords present. He knew the Yunkish wouldn't be motivated by cash, but if the sellswords heard that offer, they might get upset. That is one of the very few things that we do get from Tyrion 1 that Ben is concerned about the wealth the Yunkish are wasting, which it doesn't actually specify where he got that idea, but it's almost certainly a dot to connect there that Ben 
heard the offer from the Green Grace and was like, what? You're not going to accept all this cash? <laughs> and then <laughs> that's clearly where Ben's head usually goes. So to money. Yeah. So that that fits really well. So that's another reminder of, of like, this is the guy. Like when people talk about sell swords and motivated by money. Like we're, th we're given a lot of exceptions. Like Mero of Bravos was kind of an exception. That guy was more motivated by revenge. Uh, you know, he wanted money, and, but he was also just a brute and was motivated by killing as much as by gold. Uh, the brave companions motivated by money, but they also really just were motivated by bloodlust. The golden company, huh? That's kind of like an inversion because they're, they've been, it's been said that they don't care about money, but we're starting to suspect maybe they have become a little corrupted over time, given who their leader is and all that. Um, so this is, but Ben, ben is like the stereotype. He is the guy yeah. that's like, yeah. all that matters is money. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely fits the sellsword mold. Yeah, this, uh, the the mold, uh, the sellsword mold of the old, bold sellsword for, motivated <laughs> by gold. Yes, look at all that rhyming. Uh, great catch also by Nina, who mentions the uh, that Penny's joke about you would trade your sister for a cup of horse piss. And uh, that's remember, Jamie actually does drink horse piss when the brave companions serve it to him uh, after cutting his hand off because they're such friendly, nice men. So that's <laughs> a little nod. Um, and let's see the burning horse here. There's a, this is part of the incredible chaos <laughs> is the one of the, at least one of the corpses that's set on fire in midair lands on some people and sets a horse on fire and the rider and it goes running and this flaming horse is just running around and because it's running, it makes the fire go more instead of less. It's making it worse. And we see that same thing. In Danny's chapter, when she's on Drogon and he's hunting and he burns that one horse and then breaks its back. And this is another, it's kind of like the armor where I, I can't help but notice this pattern, but I don't really know what it means. <laughs> it's like, the, the but but it, it feels like a Dothraki thing. And I think it relates to what we, you, you, were, you brought up about maybe the Dothraki sort of, they're going to kneel to Daenerys, which maybe implies that they're effectively... Uh, in a sense, her servants are not slaves, but they're kind of forced to be uh, beholden to her because of she's the prophet of she's the stallion who mounts the world, the mare that mounts the world. Maybe mm -hmm. that's a relationship to it. The burning horses, the burning, you know, the Dothraki on fire with dragon fire. Does, oh, that, yeah. does that register at all? You think? Yeah, it does. Especially if we think that she's going to do what we what I think. I really think she's going to burn the calls. Yeah. And I think it's going to be kind of similar to the show because when they talk about these three fires, I think this is definitely one of them. And I don't necessarily think that it's about her dragons burning things. Mm, it's okay. about fires that she actually like, like she physically lights Drogo's funeral pyre. True. And I feel like this is something that she's going to physically do. Yeah. Don't know exactly how, maybe, maybe it, it doesn't matter because I don't know. Uh, the second this will be the second fire, and Valerian is the second or Valerian. Dra I do that all the time too. <laughs> Drogon <laughs> is the the, uh, the second mount, the mount to dread. Yeah. So um, maybe she will like burn them with her dragons. You know, adding on to that, the three fires you must light. None of those really sound like King's Landing. Like that doesn't really fit. No. So again, that would be her getting blamed for. That fits in really well with her not being the cause, but being getting uh taking the fall for it yeah mm, very nice yeah that fits really well good call <laughs> a very good call to bring in uh the, the house of the undying we always got to keep that in mind because it basically tells the story of danny even though even if we can't perceive what it's saying we know it's there <laughs> yeah it's it's it's, it's mysterious confusing. yeah it's mysterious <laughs> confusing and and uh intentionally hidden from us but not entirely hidden um and with Quaith, we think of that too. Like Quaith has all these names she threw out and she said, don't trust any of them. She said, don't trust the lion. She said, don't trust the Makoro. Don't trust all these other folks. Um, but, that, but we also, she's also, we don't know if she's trustworthy. Yeah, sure, should they trust her? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's actually a couple of good questions that, that comes up from that. This is a big, big question that I, I think I'm going to ask a couple different guests this one because I'm so curious about it. Melisandre ha and Stannis are... A thing that's been around for a while an important relationship a great characterization it's fun to think about them but also we can't lose sight of 
the fact that Stannis is sort of like proto Danny. Like m so many of these things that Melisandre sees in Stannis, she's really just actually seeing in Danny. She just doesn't realize she's got the wrong character. Mm -hmm. Makoro comes along wanting to be attached to Danny. What do you think about all that? Like Makoro and Danny together. Like any thoughts on where that's going to lead? And let me set you up with one funny add on to all that, which is Tyrion's reaction to Makoro. I'm really looking forward. We've talked about Tyrion's reaction to the dragons, but I really want to see Tyrion react to seeing Makoro again. Like, wait a second, bro. You were literally thrown overboard in the middle of the ocean. What the hell are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> That's going to, he's already, he's poo-pooed magic so much, like magic this, magic that. That's going to be like, okay. Along with the dragons being like, wow, those are real dragons. Because remember too, he even said to John Connington, are you sure those were real dragons? <laughs> like he's even down on the idea, but now of course he's seen them. So mm -hmm. tell me what you think about all that. Makoro and Danny and maybe a little Makoro and Tyrion if you want to throw that in there. Um, so when I was doing the live stream the other night, we were talking about Melisandre being a uh, rogue. Alicia was talking about Alicia um, Totes, not Alice, was talking about Melisandre being rogue Shout out and how Alicia. it seems like. <laughs> yeah shout out to alicia how it seems like um all the red priestess and priestesses that we've seen are like beelining to daenerys yeah so we have i i i think makoro is one of my favorites i mm -hmm. really love him i think he's an interesting character but i also do think that he's scary yeah because the, some of the things that he says are scary but like i think Tyrion's reaction to makoro may be um Maybe that kind of terror. Maybe he'd be like, oh my God, this is scary. <laughs> uh, it's him again. Oh, yeah, like, it's what? him again. But but I think like the he told Tyrion, Makoro told Tyrion, I see you with dragons, old and new, young and dark, yeah. and you in the midst of all of it. So at that point, he wasn't in that place when Tyr when Makoro gave him that prophecy. Now he's actually seeing this prophecy come to fulfillment. Oh, yeah. So he's I got think proof, he then, might. Yeah. yeah. What if Makoro becomes like a Varys character oh. for Danny? I like that idea. Like, I just w really wonder what he's going to tell her. And if, because one thing we've we've thought about too is Danny, like, she's isolated in her persona that she doesn't. It's difficult for her to not like Tyrion because it's different reasons, but similar at a baseline to Tyrion that she has. She doesn't have a lot of people she can talk to and and get to know and be friends with and, and share secrets with things like that. She actually does have more of that than Tyrion has, but it's still but it's still not like a one-to-one -one relationship. She has those relationships with people who are her subordinates and that's that's got some, you know, power and agency issues wrapped in there. Um, not to get into all that, but it, she's like more and more propped up to be godlike. Like she thinks, is this what it's like to feel like a god when she's on top of the pyramid? It doesn't make her mm -hmm. that comfortable. But here comes Makoro, like who literally believes she's Azor Ahai as told by Benero in their prophecies. So that's not going to, it's not exactly going to taper off this, this, this idea that, Daenerys is going to be told that she's, you know, a child of destiny, basically a god, like n the prophet, the savior of mankind. Like, how's that not going to go to your head, right? Yeah, I do think that is dangerous. I think um, the Makoro could be very dangerous for Daenerys when it comes to, like, inflating her mind with these grandiose ideas that she's, like, this promised one. But not only that, like, if she was to, let's say, like, take Makoro with her to Westeros and have her have him at her side that's gonna pro cause a lot of problems in Old Town I feel like um mm. with the faith because yeah. they're not gonna want the new queen to be like with R'hllor yeah they didn't like they're it when Stannis not. was so yeah they won't like this right either. and that, that that seems like a common theme throughout the um history of Westeros, <laughs> um, which is that the Targaryens have had problem, a lot of problems with the faith for different reasons. Like when it comes to like uh, intermarrying, like marrying brothers and sisters and stuff. And they, like, they've had beef with the faith a lot. So I feel like Makoro being on team Danny could be helpful, but it also could be very problematic for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. That's that's a really good way to put it because I think Makoro isn't, and you, I don't almost don't even blame him for it. Makoro isn't really concerned with Danny as a human being. If he thinks she's the savior of the world, then it's it's her, 
it's that that he cares about. He he cares about her as as the savior, not as like her wants and needs as a human being. And I guess that's mm-hmm. sort of fair play if the world hangs in the balance. Like, <laughs> yeah, if you really sincerely believe that, which he apparently does, then yeah, that would be a very small uh, factor. Just how people feel about it. Nah, to save the world, who cares? Worry about what people feel later. <laughs> But yeah, like if he's wrong, like imagine if he's just wrong, like that (laughs) takes him to all sorts of difficult directions and problems. Yeah, don't convince Daenerys of the wrong ideas. Yeah, that'd be bad. Um, So let's get uh, let's talk a little more about the Iron Islands and the Western side. I think like the 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 relationship, their past, like the history between the West and the Ironborn and maybe look ahead a little bit. Let's say uh the iron fleet most likely is going to be suborned by daenerys one way or another with or without victorian alive um mm-hmm. that it's not super important whether he survives for this question i mean i'm curious how that's going to go of course but end game we're all pretty sure i think that the iron fleet is going to be a major way for her and her armies to to get from point a to point b or point essos to point westeros i guess we could say now, with Cersei perhaps getting ejected from King's Landing, maybe fleeing back west, uh, I, you know, there's a possibility she dies before that. But let's, for purposes of this question, let's assume she escapes to the west, does some Queen in the West kind of stuff, like we saw in Fire and Blood. Mm, queen in the West. Um, does there any chance she, she allies with Euron, like we saw in the show? Not like we saw in the show, but in a sense similar because they will find themselves as allies of convenience. Perhaps they're both in the West. Euron may be facing his own iron fleet. Uh, he coming back to fight him. Uh, if, if he fails to capture Danny, then they'll be on opposite sides. So you could see this scenario um, where they make sense to be allies, but I'm not sure that the show is a great guideline, um, but it kind of makes sense on its own. So what do you think about that? Do you think any Euron Cersei stuff happens or, if you want to expand on the idea, just talk about this general relationship between the Westermen and the Ironborn and how you think that might go. I 100% think that Euron and Cersei teaming up is a thing. Okay. Um, I cool. thought it before the show did it. Ooh, nice. And, um, so I feel like the show did it because it was important to happen. Like the show went, the show like didn't really care about the Ironborn. No. And like they skipped past the all the Euron. Stuff. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, they skipped past Euron and then they went back and got him. Mm. So the fact that they went back and got him meant, to me meant that they needed him to mm. tell a certain part of the story. Okay. And I feel like he is. I know, like Cersei, she says, I think it's in Feast. She, like, I'm not climbing in bed with that pitiful pack of slimy squid. <laughs> I, I can't remember exactly what she says, <laughs> but it was hilarious. Yeah. But in the Forsaken chapter, um, Euron is in on the. I think he's sitting on the Iron Throne, and there's a pale woman behind him. Yeah. And they're like laughing and mocking dwarves. Yes. And I totally thought it was Cersei. That is, that's my mind went there as well. And this is part, partly the Viserion idea because it's that pale flame and the Viserion is a woman or is, if, if she's, if Viserion is female and then there's this pale fire, but uh, the ideas can work together. I mean, it could be one or the other, it could be both, but yeah, I'm totally with you. I'm glad you said that because I think a lot of, honestly, most people I bring this up to are not excited about that possibility. They don't think it's, it's, they, they feel like it's too much. Like there's just not time for all this. I think it'd be such an interesting dynamic. Yeah, like I do book too. Euron and book Cersei. For, uh, yeah, and for one thing too, I don't know. That, I'm not convinced Euron actually cares about Daenerys. He cares about the dragons. I think that might be just something he told Victorian to because he yeah. knows Victorian's got this thing about I'm going to steal a woman from you since you stole one from me. But all he maybe really cares about is that horn getting blown one way or the other. <laughs> it's like the rest I, is just gravy. Victorian is so dumb. Like yeah. <laughs> he, he's. <laughs> All Euron's gifts are poison. Like he says this and Euron has basically given him a gift. Like go get this dragon queen, bring her to me. <laughs> Euron is smart. So Euron knows that he's going to try to do some trickery shit. Yes. And I mean, even though Victorian is dutiful, du- dutiful, like a dutiful brother, like Euron's not stupid. Yeah. And Victorian says all Euron's gifts are poison, but then still plans to use them. So it's like, <laughs> I'll What's outwit going my brother. On? Like, no, I don't know that you will, bro. I don't think so. <laughs> but it, it, it was, it's interesting because like the, the Westernlands or the Cashley Rock and like the, the Greyjoys torched Lannisport. 
So mm-hmm. like, if is Cersei gonna care that you're on torched Lannisport, like, or you're yeah, you're on Balon, Big Terror. Like, is she gonna care? That's that's by the way one of the reasons I like this idea so much is that Euron's plans to date have involved leaving the West alone. He went straight. He went down to the Shields. He went down to the Arbor. He's going to the Old Town. Like, he hasn't antagonized them directly yet, and that might be why part of why is that George is you know wants to leave this this this, this runway open for this alliance to land <laughs> she's gonna, she's gonna definitely need allies yeah she's right need- it does make sense it does uh so speak one last uh one last little tie in here just for fun um then we'll take some questions from the live streamer or the live commenters we've got some good ones here the line uh victorian says this is just a, for fun he says they may shiver when they see your sails it's, it's telling uh, wolf one ear about their their battle plan well that is pretty much what happens <laughs> when Tyrion and jorah and these guys see the sails appear on the horizon like uh oh but they're not worried about it being the ironborn they're worried about it being the volantine fleet so they're actually <laughs> slightly relieved that it's the Greyjoys. Which is like, well, they're not actually relieved it's the Greyjoys. It's just better than it being the Valentines. It's, it's, it's like, yeah. Yeah, which is another reminder that things can always get worse. <laughs> always. Do you think the Valentine fleet will just uh, turn, just switch to Danny because they're all the slaves and all that? Or do you think uh, that might, that's one way for it to at least be quick? Like, George doesn't have to go with this big, long thing with the Valentine fleet if they just kind of overthrow their masters and join her. I don't know. Could be I mean, simple. I I think that they pro- that's probably what will happen because he's saying like these the book's going to open with these big battles they're going to be wrapped up pretty quick yeah. so they're not going to be drawn out but also like I feel like it's the smart thing for anyone to do that once you see dragons fly like Rhaegal could potentially be burning ships friend and foe alike like hmm. maybe maybe uh, not go against dragons okay. with yeah. boats. Yeah, right? Like, that's not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, like, that would be... I am rooting for... I'm rooting for the sl- the slaves that are operating the Valentini ships to, like, just overthrow it. Yeah. Yeah, that was kind of a bummer them. in the show. They were just all getting killed. Like, it's like, hey, those are yeah. just, like, innocent slizzards. <laughs> like, hey. <laughs> um, so, good question. Ashea puts up here i would like uh, she would like us to talk about Viserion dying in marine uh, your theory there a chance that does happen the idea of euron on a dragon and night king flying undead Viserion in the show like these ideas mesh together and how that might work out in the in the books like hmm. the, what version of the show what did they take from the books to get to where they got on the show i've always thought that that idea makes a lot of sense to me the idea that euron just trying to go after the citadel is pretty similar to what we saw in the show, the conceptually of the Night King is trying to destroy human knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, to destroy all the information, to reset the world into a state of of ignorance and chaos where someone like Euron could do really well. Speak of, talk about chaos as a ladder. Like that's, yeah. like Euron is aiming for maximum chaos and to build a, a freaking pyramid, let a, like a step pyramid, not a ladder, and to be the guy at the top of it. Um, like really proverbially, like that fits super well. So- um, what do you think about all that? Like, does that does that register for you? Like, I think I, I I can I can't put my finger on it, but I feel like there's stuff going on there that that lines up indirectly, but like you can feel those connections, sort of. So I always thought that there would be that she would lose one of the dragons, okay. um, and I I I thought it was Viserion, not because the show killed Viserion, but because Viserion is the smallest dragon Mm. and he is named after Viserys. The weakest. Um, (laughs) The the most movable, the the least loyal, the low. Yeah. At least. Yeah. Um, So I've went over a couple ways of how it could happen. Like could Aegon take Viserys Mm -hmm. or Viserion? Could, could Aegon take him as his dragon, like on some dragon rider thing? Um, but I keep going back to the house of the undying and the great wing beast breathing shadow fire. Yeah. I don't feel, and it's taking off from a smoking tower. Yeah. What does that so mean? So I, I'm like, I remember in Melisandre's dance at dragons, uh, POV, mm-hmm. she said she, I, I think she's, she's visioning, she's seeing these towers 
And she thinks that it's Eastwatch, but then she's like, no, those, I was there, like, those towers didn't look like that. And she just like, kind of waves it away, like, ah, whatever, it's probably. <laughs> yeah, like, those towers didn't look like that. So I'm wondering, like, is it somewhere on the wall? Yeah, or could it be Old Town? I know some people think it's Old Town that she's seeing. Old yeah. Town is a smoking tower. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like, and then we have, so we have Marwin. We have Marwin going to Daenerys. That's another one I just can't figure out, like. Where is he? He left a while ago. <laughs> so, so like, let's say the Sarion gets injured in Marine and they bring him back and Marwin's like, you know, I can fix him. And they take him like to the Citadel and Marwin does like some Kyburn shit because like Whoa. Marwin is the only person that Kyburn like. Yeah, you're totally right. That yeah. looks up to. So like. Marwin probably could do the same shit Kyburn can do. And then he takes off flying like as the shadow dragon from the Citadel and they can't control him. That would be Whoa. crazy. That would be so that cool. That would be crazy. I know. There's just so I many just... possibilities that like th th it's not too crazy though, right? Because like everything is escalating. The magic is all going up. And as much as the show cut out so much supernatural, they gave us a freaking undead dragon flying around yeah. and torching the wall. Like they didn't cut that humongous supernatural thing out. <laughs> Like the biggest thing of all. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there will be any white hunt. There, yeah, there will be no white hunt. <laughs> maybe not. Yeah, that's that's yeah. <laughs> if if it is, It'll push me different. into traffic. Push me into traffic. <laughs> I can't take it. <laughs> a couple of super chats here from Dan Windsor, Lord of the H, sends in a H H H. Howdy, thank you, Dan. Appreciate the support. Tracy McMillan up there says greetings from beyond the wall. She says that because she is Lady R. R. Dross. She is. Uh, a, a Scottish person, and Scott, uh, the, the the Scots live beyond the wall, Hadrian's Wall, way up there in their awesome hill country with their beautiful uh, scenery that I have not visited in person, but would like to someday. Um, Lady Ashley, the Iron Underneath, sends a boss sticker. Thank you, Lady Ashley. Shelly One sends a good job thumbs up sticker. Thank you very much, Shelly. Austin Flowers, nice name, by the way. Austin Flowers says, I like my coffee like I like Makoro. Tall, dark, and hot AF. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Makoro is hot, though. <laughs> he is literally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kolnitsky says, Romans fastened their hoods to nipple rings. Really? Wow. Whoa. All right, then. The Romans figured out a use for nipple rings. <laughs> Keep that hood on. <laughs> wow. I did not know that. I bet you didn't either. <laughs> I, I bet, did not. I bet most of y'all out there. Thanks, Kolnitsky. That's that's good. Uh, that's good trivia. JC Wilder eighty six says Danny will appreciate that Makoro was a slave. Ooh, great point. See, that's something that Melisandre and and Stannis don't have. Is that Melisandre was a slave, but that's not like a a thing for her to bring up around Stannis. Stannis might actually think less of her if he heard that because he's kind of a proud, you know, noble guy. Like he's got that attitude, even though he dresses down and all that. He still has that kind of I'm better than you attitude. So. That's a good point. Like, that's a point of connection, which is ominous, because as you said, we, we don't we're not necessarily excited about Makoro's influence over Danny. So does that yeah. does that add something for you there? It does. And I think it is a very good point, because that's part of the reason that I think Danny is going to forgive Jorah is because Jorah is going to be coming back to her with the nipple rings and face tattoos like <laughs> he's a slave for all like he's coming back to her as a slave that's a basically. good point yeah and dornish dame says yeah i think she turns up with the draft foreign army foreign gods and is up against an Aegon who has got who has gotten in good with the faith and yeah like when you say lay it out like that it's pretty easy to see that westeros will take the side of rhaegar's son over the mad king's daughter of course that's not how i see it and that's not how you see it most likely but mm -hmm. That is how a lot of Westerosi will see it, and especially a, a, an expert propagandist like Varus is is laying that all out uh, before Danny even gets to Westeros. Like that's what she's yeah. up against. And this is, Dornis James finishes the comment with, "I feel like Viserys didn't bother with Danny's religious education." That's a really good point. Viserys didn't prepare her for hardly anything, but like, did he even mention the? I don't remember that coming up at all. Like in her early chapters, like the faith and like that's an important political. Uh, you know, thing to be worried about, like the the faith are so powerful. So, yeah, yeah. 
I, n- I never recall her talking much about gods. No, not hardly at, at all. all. Yeah, it's it's not really a thing. I mean, besides like the, the Dothraki religion comes up a bit because she's kind of yeah. gets in with that. But that's, in it. you know, yeah. <laughs> and not even realizing that she's probably the savior, the prophet that they've all been referring to. It's not like a stallion that mounts the world. No, it's a <laughs> mare that mounts the world. And that's you. <laughs> yes. Um, Noga Frankel says, or Noga F says, I think Tyrion will ride a dragon for a short while before this dragon will be kidnapped by Euron, and this way Tyrion will fall in captivity. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Tyrion being captured by Euron is a, certainly a, a thing that's out there as a theory. Uh, the quiet lion theory that he like would cut Tyrion's tongue out, um, because he's you know, that's the thing he does to people have you considered that theory ever and you know if you have or haven't i'd like to get your reaction to it um no but i was just reading a game of thrones for obsidian knights i was just reading a game of thrones Tyrion five i think Tyrion four when he's outside of the veil with braun and braun says somebody's gonna cut your tongue out Ooh. like <laughs> He basically somebody I don't remember the exact quote, but it it's about like how Tyrion's getting smart with Bronn, and Bronn's is basically like you need to watch your mouth because one day somebody's going to cut your tongue out. Oh wow! <laughs> and I was I was thinking like it could actually be Danny that winded up cutting his tongue out. Ooh. Like if it, I, I so I don't think that Danny is Mad Queen like at, at all. Um, but if if she is, if that's what George is going with, then it would be a kind of a parallel for Danny yeah. to do some Aries kind of things to people. But um, I mean, I don't necessarily believe that, but I would love to see a uh, Euron cut Tyrion's tongue out. <laughs> the style of the ultimate style. Like, <laughs> whoa. How would his chapters his work chap- from then yeah, on? Yeah, his like, chapters would be like, blah, 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 blah. oh man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one thing that's like a, a, a knock against the theory is like, how on earth do his chapters work from that point on? Like, I don't know, because he's the he's literally the character with the most screen time, like the most length of his chapters added together. So, boy, a chance. I mean, of course, to be fair, unlike Danny and uh, John, who also have you know huge amounts of screen time, Tyrion's is a lot more. Uh, a mix of his own stuff and ob- observation. I mean, a lot of these chapters, yeah. they're observation characters. Like Ariel Hota is the ultimate observer and very little is about him where on the other end of the spectrum, Danny is pretty much always the center of whatever's going on in her chapters. <laughs> like she does less time. Like she doesn't have as much screen time as Tyrion, but she has, it's a lot more focused on her when it is on her. So it's like, you can't just judge these things by like how many pages are in the Tyrion's chapters. But I think mm-hmm. that's an important thing. So maybe, yeah, maybe he's an observer. Like uh, maybe... He can still communicate with Bran or I don't know. Yeah, it's really just uh, I don't like thinking about it because <laughs> the, <laughs> the thought of having a tongue cut out is just like gives me the. Ugh. Hey, we're, the we're he- podcasters. He's... We can't lose our voices. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But there, there is I think I've heard a couple of theories about like Tyrion's tongues getting getting cut out. Yeah. But like I, the theory I heard was like about a third trial that he might have. Third trial. Ooh. Like where he's had his his trial at King's Landing, he's had the one in the Vale, but he might have a third one. Mm. Wow! Okay. So yeah, that'd be, that'd be interesting. But I, I mean, I I love this chapter; it's really good. Yeah, right. Things do come in threes. That's something we noticed a lot here. Um, this one, one of the few topics we haven't discussed that we have here in our document. There's just a lot of things coming in threes. Now that's just kind of normal, anyway. I mean, the law of small numbers is like most things do come in small numbers, like. If you have children, it's probably between one and three children. If you have brothers and sisters, same difference, probably between one and three. You can't have more than four uh, grandparents, you know, <laughs> like unless besides adoptions and things like that. So so sometimes threes are just a lot of threes because there's three is a very common number. But like you pointed out earlier, very accurately, sometimes they're it's less likely to be a coincidence in a, in a book than it is in the real world. Uh, when there's so many things like that. So let me, all this time I've been vamping, trying to find where I have this in the document. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, here it is. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So a bunch of threes here. We have um, the theme of threes. One's, the one is, the, of course, the, the three cha- uh, three characters. We have three POVs giving us the action here. Barrison, Victorian, and Tyrion. Then we have... Uh, 
all of them associated with dragons in some way. The Tyrion's a dragon obsessed. Victorian's got this the dragon horn, and Barristan is carrying a dragon standard, wearing a dragon helm, and leading troops in Danny's name. Uh, the horse, or the guy yells to horse three times to horse, to horse, to horse. Um, this is Tyrion's third battle. Tyrion has this line: "No one heard, no one answered, no one cared." So that's kind of in threes. Um, there's also basically a few different battles here getting started at the beginning um if you count the battle of blood for euron that could be the third one um really though i'm not so two questions here if you want to weigh in on the threes i'd love to hear it but if you have nothing to say about that that's not not terribly surprising uh, what i'm <laughs> curious about is what you foresee for like future battles against his we talked a little bit about this against his family and whether you see him succeeding in that or, you know, facing down with Aegon and John Connington. I'm curious what your thoughts are as the future of, of a little more about Tyrion as a, as a general. Tyrion as a general, I think he's going to uh, be very inch justify the means, very Tywin. I feel like that's what the beginning of this chapter was showing us, yeah. that he's going to embrace like who his father was, like standing above the battlefield, seeing men die for him without like batting an eye. I feel like he's going to be like that. And at least while he's in Marine, can he be like that while he sees his own family's armies murdered? Mm. I'm not sure. What about Danny? I, Do you I think, think Danny's going to like start to see all this as well? Like, will she start to, you know, go push back against so many, like the cost of, of her wanting to reclaim the throne? Um, I think... That's Maybe hard to say. it's hard to predict what her state it's of mind so is, hard. Be, right? Yeah, yeah, it's so hard. I feel like the, for Daenerys to become ruth, like she is ruthless, like she's not a pushover, she's not, <clears throat> she just happens to be merciful. Yeah, so she, I could, I, okay. she knows how to be merciless, but she would prefer to be merciful if that yes. makes sense. Yeah, yes, so I feel like she doesn't want to be like this. Uh, like she, she wants to be, she doesn't, she doesn't want to be a butcher. She doesn't want to be a butcher, but I feel like she's going to have to be at a certain point mm. because you can't be like, like take Ned Stark. Like he's, he wants to be honorable in a game where everyone isn't honorable. So he loses the game. Yes. So with Daenerys, like you have to be Ruth, just as ruthless as your enemies because mm -hmm. Cersei's going to be ruthless yeah, Varus the Golden is Company. Be ruthless. Yeah, they're all going to be ruthless. Yeah, they're going to be ruthless. So she's going to have to match energy. Yeah, she can't be the so, least ruthless person in the game. That won't work. You're right. Hmm. Yeah, so I think that she is. I think she's. I think she's going to love. I think she's going to love Tyrion. <laughs> she may not. Yeah, she might be like, well, I need this. Like it's. It's almost like Stannis. Like you said, which this is another thing that uh, ties us in with Stannis. Is Stannis is very much an ends justify the means kind of guy. He's like, look the. I was denied my rights. Whatever I need to do to get my rights is fair game for the most part. Um, and yeah. That, that could work out. Yeah. Um, I kind of see Tyrion as like a mix between Dario and Barristan. Ooh. For Dan. Yeah, okay. Like, like Dario is just kind of like all butchery mm -hmm. and Barristan mm -hmm. is like tact and skill and what's best. And Tyrion is both of those. So while yeah. Tyrion might might do some butchery, it will all work out for what the greater good or the ends. What do you even though it's probably going to be awful? Speaking of Dario, do you have any ideas on what might happen with him? We we see that he's probably been freed by the wind blown here, and that means he's probably going to get back to Daenerys. But like the way the show left it, it doesn't really tell us much. Like I definitely one hundred and twenty percent. I'm positive Daenerys is not going to leave Marine with with Dario in charge. That seems just completely outlandish. I think that was just a product of them not having other characters. They just didn't yes. introduce another kid. Like who else would like? There's the only named character left was, was like, well, I guess it's Dario. There's no, <laughs> there's yeah, no there's, shave bait. There's no green grace. There's no one <laughs> these other characters. So there's no way she's going to leave. Book Danny is going to leave book Dario in charge of Marine, but will she br no bring? Will she leave him behind? Like, will she? Do you think she brings him to Westeros um, with? Mm, that's a tough one. I, it is tough. I think it could go either way, but I do think like when they kill Brown Ben Plum, 
it's going to be Dario that does it. Ooh, he did does promise it. to kill him. He did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're I right. think it's going to be Dario that does it. Do you think there'll be, speaking of problems between in Danny's court, uh, Dario and Ben could definitely be an issue. What about Barristan and Jorah? Do you think, Bar like, if Jorah gets forgiven, do you think he's going to be angry with Barristan for being, like, the one to out him and all that? Do you think that'll be a little bitterness? Because he, he actually kind of says something, like, to that design. Like, they're talking about strategy in this one, and they're like, yeah, what, what's if, if Selmy, Selmy's probably going to go attack the trebuchets to stop them from flinging the corpses. And mm -hmm. Tyrion's like, that's what I would do. And Barristan's, and, and, and Jorah's like, that's what I would do, but I would have done it sooner. <laughs> <laughs> I I kind of think that Barristan is gonna die. Okay, so maybe it won't even matter. Like they won't even. Like, it won't. Come yeah, up. like I feel like he's gonna. I feel like one of them has to die. Hmm. If not, if not, I could see. Uh, and I hate that. Like I agree with this theory, but I who was it? I think it was Jeff Brendan B. Fish from okay. Not a Cast. Yeah. That said something about Barristan going over to Aegon. Yeah, yeah, we we did actually. He and I did an episode on that together. We we just we okay, went through it was that a big nice discussion episode that we called it a uh, the white cloak turned is still white. So yeah, I'm, so I'm why do you why do you think that. why do you think he would leave Danny? Well, there's and a, when do you think? Well, it, it would be because he uh, a couple of, a couple reasons. There's a, a little bit of foreshadowing for it that we talk about. I mean, that might be foreshadowing for it. Um, that uh, he, there's a lot of parallels between him and Kristen Cole, and that was kind of Kristen Cole's deal was with turning on the young princess. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, but but also it's about Barrison not wanting to to make to repeat the mistakes of Ares. So now I'm not I'm with you that I don't think Danny's going to go Mad Queen, but he might perceive things differently, um, mm -hmm. and he doesn't want to he doesn't want to repeat the mistakes of serving Ares like he did, but also. His goal, he, like he said, he's like, my goal was to go out and find the real king and serve them. And if he is falls for this lie that Ray, that's really Rhaegar's son, then he might think that's the real, the real person, the one who's actually following mm -hmm. the faith and, and has Rhaegar's you know, son and, and all these other, these other trappings of power that tie him to Rhaegar. So yeah, I'm not sold on it. I just think it fits really well. For reference, though, our our own uh, contributor Nina is completely against it. She's like, "Nah, he's gonna die. Skahas is gonna kill him, or something like that. It won't even come up." And I totally agree with that as a strong possibility. Without like, I won't pull, fully support either idea and say it's definitely that or definitely the other. I so I love. I just love how well it's set up that I could s totally see it being either because they're both well set up, but n neither is like conclusive. So hopefully that. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I was just saying, I don't think Barristan is going to be around. So yeah. one way or the like, I don't feel like Barristan and Jora can coexist in a good way that will be beneficial for Daenerys. It, it also fits really well with what you're saying or with what with the beginning of the series. Like Ned, the one guy that stood with Ned Stark when he's like, I won't kill Daenerys. I won't murder her. I won't murder a child was Barristan. And that's part of what Barristan sees in Danny. He's like, she protects kids. And he, in his mind, he's like, oh, yeah, that's a really good thing. So, um, that in that sense, it's like, yeah, Barrison isn't just with Danny because these other things. He legit has the similar values to her, and that's that's a really tough sell for her. Him changing, him like turning on her. So yeah, in a lot of ways, I can totally see the him dying off but just being a simpler and more tragic ending because she he would be a good influence potentially amidst so many other people who are have their own goals like save the world or revenge on my family from Tyrion or Jorah is like i want you whereas <laughs> someone like uh this character like this would be more like a noble like Barristan doesn't want anything from from Danny he doesn't he doesn't want anything other mm -hmm. than to protect her and be a good and that's that like that's good you know at least it, if you narrow yeah. it down like that so that's probably <laughs> <laughs> like ominous yeah like well he, she can't have nice things <laughs> uh yeah this is a, this whole story we, we always have to come back to that this is a tragedy isn't it <laughs> we're not bittersweet endings the best we can hope for right hmm. okay i think that's it for the questions i don't think i had any more main topics or subtopics so let's uh let's close it out here um yeah, thanks really very much for coming. This was a great discussion. Uh, we we bounced a lot of ideas. Me. Yeah, you're welcome. You you gave me a lot to think about. Like uh, bringing in new voices gives uh, bringing in new ideas. 
uh, it's a great way. It's a great thing about this community. It's like uh, we all are able to work together pretty easily for the most part. There's a few exceptions, yeah. but but it, it works <laughs> out very well <laughs> overall. <laughs> yes. Well, I look yes. forward to being uh, able to hang out in person coming. again too. Oh yeah, I can't wait um, until Corona goes away. Yeah, it's not we're, the lights at the end of the tunnel, right? <laughs> yeah. There was an old it saying is. from uh, Dungeons and Dragons that said, "The light at the end of a tunnel." Might be an oncoming dragon, but <laughs> never forget. True. Yeah. So, hey, in this fandom, that's that's a good that one. That one lands. We feel that, but we would like that. We want we want the dragons because the dragons at the end of the tunnel means we get the next book. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. So, what's next for you? What do you got work going on over a uh, gray area YouTube? What, I know you got Obsidian Knights. You're doing your uh, reread, which is awesome. That's you've got uh, same thing you're doing basically with a variety of different people which really helps mm -hmm. uh, broaden the, the takes and gives you new ideas, exposes us to the things we hadn't th thought about before. Uh, so yeah, what do you got? What else do you got coming up and all that? Um, so I have some Winds of Winter stuff, some theory stuff. Um, I'm doing the reread on, on The Witcher. I just nice. finished um, for like, so I do these like short story videos where I just compact them down and kind of go over them really quickly. So I am, I have four of them done. I'm on the fifth one, which is A Grain of Truth, which is one of my favorite ones. It has some very good quotes in it. It is so good. I love A Grain of Truth. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm doing some mythology stuff um, on American Horror Story. So oh, some okay. history and mythology stuff on like the different seasons of American Horror Story. And the new season was announced. So I'll be covering that. Um, and I, I made a Twitch where I play video games. Oh, so. cool. <laughs> That's fun. That's what what games fun. are you playing over there? So I, I normally play Warzone, which okay. is a, a first person shooter game. But, um, last night I did the first episode of the Telltale game from a Game of Thrones. Really? Oh, yeah. Cool. And I know That's it's been cool. out for a while, but I never played it before. It's so. pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, they get those voices. They get the real actors in there for a lot of those voices. Yeah, it's it's pretty solid. You know, I freaked out on stream because I wasn't expecting Ethan to die. So my <laughs> my my Ethan died, and yeah. I was like, "Oh my god!" He didn't just so, die yeah. too. It was brutal, wasn't it? Brutal. Our, our reaction at the red wedding. I don't remember what happened. Shay is asking. I don't remember what. What did All we do? All of a sudden, we realized we were at the red wedding. Oh yeah, well, Shay and I played <laughs> together. Yeah, we didn't realize what was going. Like, oh my god, we're at the red wedding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like that it, but it's so cool like because it's outside of the red wedding and like you're kind of just like soldier, you could just yeah, feel yeah. it building you could feel it building and then you hear the rain the cast and it's like gotta go oh like oh peace oh my god <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so that is really that's cool. that's what i've been doing uh jumping back real quick yeah you uh it's cool that you're doing witcher stuff i've got a pod um over on our side we do we're working on that too and we're so excited for season two and all that maybe we'll uh maybe we'll have to collab sometime we'll see <laughs> yeah sure cool well again thanks everybody uh thanks for people who came live and sent questions a lot of good questions i see ooh, one last uh super chat from silas tom sends a superhero chicker sticker that is appreciate that silas Silas is our uh, is a good friend who knows a lot about the Lovecraft stuff. We've we've talked about that stuff together. He's very knowledgeable on uh, on that. I I once reported a theory that I got from him on uh, the the Red Comet that comes from Lovecraft lore. So I don't remember where I talked about that though. Anyway, also folks out there, we've got our, our the Winds of Winter audio project is still ongoing. It's going to be ongoing for a while. Our engineers are. Well, you know, they're creators, they're artists, and they want it to be really good. So uh, that means it's going to be a little slower than we thought, but that's a good thing. The final product will be better. If you want to submit your your uh, yourself to do auditions and, and take a role of a character, whether you want to do a character that's got lots and lots to say or a couple that we just have one line. You know, there's like a, over 100 voices that we're casting so any of y'all want to get involved, join our Discord or our Facebook group. That's where the majority of the discussions are taking place. You can also just email any auditions you have to westeroshistory at gmail.com. And we're, we're handling them one at a time. So you may not hear from us for, for a while, but rest assured, we uh, won't forget about anybody. So uh, next time up, we have Barriston1. That will be with Game of Owns. The folks from Game of Owns, they're, they're also doing rereads over there. We'll be very curious to see what they have to say about this Winds of Winter chapter because they're, they're actually like 
really closely aligned with where we're at right now. So that this is fresh for them. So that'd be really, really good that we're happened to be aligned at the same time. Um, so thanks again as well. Uh, shout out to Ashe over here running things behind the scenes. Thanks to our History of Westeros mods over on the Facebook group. Thanks to people who hang out on Flick or Facebook, Slack, and Discord. Um, our Flick commenters had a, another really great set of takes over there. We a couple of their, their notes got into here. Same goes for Facebook and Discord and Slack. Lots of great contributions every time. Thanks to Michael Klarfeld uh, for the video intro and the maps you see behind us. Thanks to Kevin McLeod, Jesse Townsend, and Joey Koval for our various p music. You did it again. What? Did I say Joey? You said, you said Jesse Townsend, Joey Koval. Oh, did I really? <laughs> I do it every time. I'm so sorry, guys. Joey Townsend and Jesse Koval <laughs> are music. Their names are so similar, but they aren't. <laughs> What's funny is neither of them are probably ever hearing me say that. <laughs> but it's, I really should get it right. I'm a bad person. Uh, thanks to our Benjineer for making our sound quality so much better and for his work as well. Uh, he's one of the people working on the Winds of Winter chapter projects. Uh, thanks to our many patrons for the financial support. We wouldn't be here without you. Wouldn't be able to do this every week. And hey, if you're uh, around at six, if you're watching this live, check out Here Be Dragons. Even if you're not watching this live, check out Here Be Dragons, our friends over there. I don't know what they're doing today. Um, usually we keep track of what their stream is, but uh, if, if we wait like two seconds here, Ashea can go tell yeah. us. On social anxiety. Oh, on social anxiety. Okay, that's really good. So that's an important, that's a more, a more serious topic than usual, something that's uh, very relevant. I know Stephen in particular said that becoming a YouTuber is one of the ways that he's helped himself deal with that. So uh, I would be very curious to hear what he has to say. He's a very thoughtful, open guy and is very would, would love to share the ways that he's dealt with uh, some of these things. And it's a, I'm very glad and thankful that he's taking on this topic. So Good on him and whoever else he's got with him uh, for that stream. Well, thanks again, Gray. We'll uh, we'll be chatting again soon. Appreciate your takes and uh, everybody else. See you next time. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Bye. 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 Valar, reread us, everyone. <laughs>